the plan is more Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom and more Dracula Read Aloud. It's going to be live. Gist, I think. So we go over here. Everyone, welcome back. I'm Christina, the manager at the Pacific Beach Library, and I'm happy to join you for day two of our read aloud together of Dracula by Bram Stoker. Um, Yesterday we just read one chapter. We're going to just read one chapter every day. We're going to be able to space this one out nicely to take us over um, really close to Halloween. And so I thought we'd start by enjoying some tea. Today's tea is called Berry Blossom. As you can see, it's another beautiful blood red kind of tea. Hi, Helen. Good to see you. Um, let, me, let me go ahead and press this one down and pour out. Oh, I hope you guys are enjoying something wonderful today. I hope your day is going beautifully. Let's see. How's my day been going so far? I think it's been good. It's weird how the days sort of blur into each other, but yeah, it's been a nice day so far. And of course, better now that we're reading together. Ooh, I like this one a lot. The berry flavor just, again, adds that illusion of sweetness, even though it's you know not sugared at all. Um, I haven't added any sweetener to it, but it has that just sweet flavor because of the fruit. It's really a lovely tea. Okay, so let's let that one get cool. And we'll talk a little bit about what happened in chapter one of Dracula. I did want to show you, though, a couple of extra additions. Um, one of my coworkers brought in two of her additions from home, um, and of course one of them I left with her. Hi, Judy. Um, I'm just going to share. This is another one that we had on our shelf here at the library, just in our paperback classic section. But again, a couple little illustrations. Um, one of the other ones that my coworker brought in, of course I don't have it with me, so I can't show you, but it was beautiful. It had every chapter heading was written in blood red, um, and so that was nice. But this this is the beautiful one this is the annotated edition the new annotated edition of dracula edited by leslie s Klinger. it is stunning i was oh no we just had a little disconnect i hope this doesn't like yesterday where we get disconnected several times um but let's hope for the best i'm a little tempted to start over because i, I think i identified yesterday what the problem was but i might have forgotten to fix it so let's hope Let's keep going. Let's keep going. We just got one more chapter of this, and then um, if it does keep disconnecting today, I really will try to fix it by tomorrow. Sorry. Um, so I was going to say, this beautiful annotated edition, it is stunning. And what's interesting about it is it takes, let's just take a look at chapter one. For this first section of chapter one, what we read yesterday, here's the first couple of paragraphs, like the first two and a half paragraphs. It goes through 17 footnotes, which on the other half of the page, it gives the first one, first half of one footnote, and then it has a full another. Oh dear, I went too far. It has a full another one, two, three, four, five, six more pages 
of annotations and footnotes just explaining how the um, the different bits about the what was mentioned in those two and a half paragraphs. So it's a really rich description. Um, I was telling Rebecca my coworker who brought this in, that I, what I think I'm going to try doing is reading over the chapter with you in the standard form and then going back and reviewing the annotated edition. <coughs> Sorry, the disconnects are really annoying. Um, to see if there's anything in particular that um, we need to add in to explain. So let's go ahead and do a quick review of yesterday's reading. And if I, there's anything special from the annotation, I'll go ahead and share that with you as we go. So basically, um, what the in chapter one it was from taken from Jonathan Harker's journal. Jonathan Harker is our original narrator here in the book. We're going to have multiple narrators because the, the entire book is actually told from the. Um, it's framed as being excerpts from various characters' journals or diaries or even newspaper articles, and so therefore we are getting um, multiple narrators, each sharing their perspective on the story. And again, um, we have to keep in mind too how truthful they may or may not be being as as we go along because again Jonathan Harker is um, our first narrator and we can hope only hope he's being as honest and forthright in his account as he can be. So it starts out with Jonathan Harker is on his way he's an attorney he's English he's on his way to visit a client in Transylvania this client is named Count Dracula and he has instructions to stay in a in a town in in Bistritz and then he's going to catch the conveyance that will take him over to Castle Dracula the following day. So what happens is as he's getting ready to leave from Bistritz, he informs the proprietors of the hotel where he's staying that he is on his way to visit Castle Dracula. And the woman who is the proprietress of the hotel is basically very per per um, perturbed. She doesn't advise him to go and specifically she doesn't want him to go that day. Because she, she says, when it is the eve of St. George's Day, when the clock strikes midnight, all the evil things in the world have full sway. And so the implication is that um, the, the vampires and the demons will have, you know, a better ability to reach out to the, to the regular human world. And so he is in more jeopardy. She gives him a crucifix to wear, even though he's not very religious, he takes that from her just out of respect. And when he, the following day on May the 5th, he's ready to go and take the coach on the journey to, um, when he's ready to go to Castle Dracula, um, he is, um, either he hears the other people on the, in the coach talking about him. And basically they're saying, you know, something about, um, let's see, let me get, if I can get to the right words. He, he's, he's saying something like about Satan and hell and witches and, um, werewolves or vampires and he makes a note which I found super amusing that he must remember to ask the count about these superstitions um, so they make the they make signs to ward off the evil eye and in fact the coachman tries to hurry the um, the trip over so he gets there an hour earlier beyond when he was expected to arrive so that he can say oh look there's no carriage here to pick he says there's no carriage here to pick you up, so instead of getting out, you should really just continue on with me and maybe come back the next day or the day after. So the coachman and the people in the carriage are trying to protect Jonathan Harker from being taken in by, Cas by Count Dracula. But instead, a carriage shows up, and the carriage is driven by a driver who is quite dramatic in his appearance. He, he has a hard-looking mouth, very red lips, and sharp-looking teeth as white as ivory. Dun, dun, dun. And so this driver takes in... Um, Jonathan Harker and they begin driving on their way to Castle Dracula they actually it's kind of weird um, they kill time for a while driving around and they see blue lights in the distance the driver gets out and he goes and does something and then he comes back now what the annotated edition says and again what it implies is that there's a superstition that on this night after midnight there are treasures that appear and they can be illuminated by blue lights and after midnight they can be taken by creatures of evil versus before midnight the the treasures the hidden treasures that only appear um, twice per year could only be taken by creatures of good and so the implication is that Dracula is actually searching out treasures and so on his finally as they're heading back they see um, they hear the sounds of dogs and then wolves howling into the night and Jonathan Harker is quite frightened by this and finally they're able to beat them away and actually the, the driver um, 
The driver, as he swept out his long arms as though brushing aside some impalpable obstacle, the wolves fell back and back further still. So again, the implication is that Count, excuse me, the driver, we can probably guess is Count Dracula, but we're not certain yet. This driver has the ability to drive back the, the wolves. So he has some control over them. Um, finally, they head on back, um, they head over to the castle. And so now we're going to continue with chapter two, which is a continuation of Jonathan Harper's journal. All right. Let's get fortified with some tea and go into our story. Chapter two, Jonathan Harker's, chapter two, Jonathan Harker's journal continued. Five May, I must have been asleep for certainly if I had been fully awake, I must have noticed the approach of such a remarkable place. In the gloom, the courtyard looked of considerable size, and as several dark ways led from it under great round arches, it perhaps seemed bigger than it really is. I have not yet been able to see it by daylight. When the caleche stopped, the driver jumped down and held out his hand to assist me to alight. Again, I could not but notice his prodigious strength. His hand actually seemed like a steel vice that could have crushed mine if he had chosen. Then he took my traps and placed them on the ground beside me as I stood close to a great door, old and studded with large iron nails and set in a projecting doorway of massive stone. I could see even in the dim light that the stone was massively carved, but that the carving had been made, excuse me, but that the carving had been much worn by time and weather. As I stood, the driver jumped again into his seat and shook the reins. The horses started forward, and trap and all disappeared down one of the dark openings. I stood in silence where I was, for I did not know what to do. Of bell or knocker there was no sign. Through these frowning walls and a dark window, excuse me, through these frowning walls and dark window openings, it was not likely that my voice could penetrate. The time I waited seemed endless, and I felt doubts and fears crowding upon me. What sort of place had I come to, and among what kind of people? What sort of grim adventure was it on hand, was it on which I had embarked? Was this a customary incident in the life of a solicitor's clerk sent out to explain the purchase of a London estate to a foreigner? Solicitor's clerk. Mina would not like that. Solicitor. For just before leaving London, I got word that my examination was successful, and I am now a full-blown solicitor. I began to rub my eyes and pinch myself to see if I were awake. It all seemed like a horrible nightmare to me, and I expected that I should suddenly awake and find myself at home, with the dawn struggling in through the windows, as I had now and again felt in the morning after a day of overwork. But my flesh answered the pinching test, and my eyes were not to be deceived. I was indeed awake and among the Carpathians. All I could do now was to be patient and to wait the coming of the morning. Just as I had come to this conclusion, I heard a heavy step approaching behind the great door and saw through the chinks the gleam of a coming light. Then there was the, then there was the sound of rattling chains and the clanking of massive bolts drawn back. A key was turned with a loud grating noise of long disuse and the great door swung back. Within stood a tall old man, clean-shaven save for a long white mustache, and clad in black from head to foot, without a single speck of color about him anywhere. He held in his hand an antique silver lamp, in which the flame burned without chimney or globe of any kind, throwing long, quivering shadows as it flickered in the draught of the open door. The old man motioned me in with his right hand with a courtly gesture, saying in excellent English but with a strange intonation, "'Welcome to my house!' Enter freely and of your own will. He made no motion of stepping to meet me, but stood like a statue, as though his gesture of welcome had fixed him into stone. The instant, however, that I stepped over the threshold, he moved impulsively forward, and holding out his hand, grasped mine with a strength which made me wince, an effect which was not lessened by the fact that it seemed as cold as ice, more like the hand of a dead than a living man. Again he said, Welcome to my house. Come freely, go safely, and leave something of the happiness you bring. The strength of the handshake was so much akin to that which I had noticed in the driver, whose face I had not seen, that for a moment I doubted if it were not the same person to whom I was speaking. So to make sure, I said interrogatively, Count Dracula? He bowed in a courtly way as he replied, 
I am Dracula, and I bid you welcome, Mr. Harker, to my house. Come in. The night air is chill, and you must need to eat and rest. As he was speaking, he put the lamp on a bracket on the wall, and stepping out, took my luggage. He had carried it in before I could forestall him. I protested, but he insisted. Nay, sir, you are my guest. It is late, and my people are not available. Let me see to your comfort myself. He insisted on carrying my traps along the passage and then up to a great winding stair and along another great passage on whose stone floor our steps rang heavily. At the end of this he threw open a heavy door and I rejoiced to see within a well-lit room in which a table was spread for supper and on whose mighty hearth a great fire of logs, freshly replenished, flamed and flared. The Count halted, putting down my bags, closed the door, and crossing the room opened another door, which led into a small octog octagonal room lit by a single lamp, and seemingly without a window of any sort. Passing through this, he opened another door and motioned me to enter. It was a welcome sight, for here was a great bedroom well lighted and warmed with another log fire, also added to but lately, for the top logs were fresh, which sent a hollow roar up the wide chimney. The Count himself left my luggage inside and withdrew, saying, before he closed the door, You will need, after your journey, to refresh yourself by making your toilette. I trust you will find all you wish. When you are ready, come into the other room, where you will find your supper prepared. The light and warmth and the Count's courteous welcome seemed to have dissipated all my doubts and fears. Having then reached my normal state, I discovered that I was half famished with hunger. So making a hasty toilette, I went into the other room. I found supper already laid out. My host, who stood on one side of the great fireplace, leaning against the stonework, made a graceful wave of his hand to the table and said, I pray you be seated and sup how you please. You will, I trust, excuse me that I do not join you, but I have dined already and I do not sup. I handed to him the sealed letter which Mr. Hawkins had entrusted to me. He opened it and read it. Let's go back. I handed to him the sealed letter which Mr. Hawkins had entrusted to me. He opened it and read it gravely. Then, with a charming smile, he handed it to me to read. One passage of it, at least, gave me a thrill of pleasure. I must regret that an attack of gout, from which malady I am a... I must regret that an attack I must regret that an attack of gout from which malady I am a constant sufferer forbids an attack of gout from which malady I am a constant sufferer forbids absolutely any traveling on my part for some time to come but I am happy to say I can send a sufficient substitute one in whom I have every possible confidence he is a young man full of energy and talent in his own way, and of a very faithful disposition. He is discreet and silent and has grown into manhood in my service. He shall be ready to attend to you when you will, when you will during his stay, and shall take your instructions in all matters. The Count himself came forward and took off the cover of a dish, and I fell to at once on an excellent roast chicken. This, with some cheese and a salad and a bottle, this, with some cheese and a salad and a bottle of old Tokay, of which I had two glasses, was my supper. During the time I was eating it, the Count asked me many questions as to my journey, and I told him by degrees all I had experienced. By this time I had finished my supper, and by my host's desire had drawn up a chair by the fire and begun to smoke a cigar which he offered me, at the same time excusing himself that he did not smoke. I had now an opportunity of observing him and found him of a very marked physiognomy. His face was a strong, a very strong aquiline with high bridge of the thin nose and peculiar, peculiarly arched nostrils, with lofty domed forehead and hair growing scantily round the temples but profusely elsewhere. His eyebrows were very massive, almost meeting over the nose and with bushy hair that seemed to curl in its own profusion. The mouth, so far as I could see it under the heavy mustache, was fixed and rather cruel-looking, with peculiarly sharp white teeth. 
These protruded over the lips, whose remarkable ruddiness showed astonishing vitality in a man of his years. For the rest, his ears were pale, and at the tops extremely pointed. The chin was broad and strong, and the cheeks firm, though thin. The general effect was one of extraordinary pallor. Hitherto I, Hitherto I had noticed the backs of his hands as they lay on his knees in the firelight, and they had seemed rather white and fine. But seeing them now close to me, I could not but notice they were rather coarse broad with squat fingers. Strange to say, there were hairs in the center of the palm. The nails were long and fine and cut to a sharp point. As the Count leaned over me and his hands touched me, I could not repress a shudder. It may have been that his breath was rank, but a horrible feeling of nausea came over me, which, do what I would, I could not conceal. The Count, evidently noticing it, drew back, and with a grim sort of smile, which showed more than he had yet done his protuberant teeth, sat himself down again on his own side of the fireplace. We were both silent for a while, and as I looked towards the window, I saw the first dim streak of the coming dawn. There, there seemed a strange stillness over everything, but as I listened, I heard as if from down below in the valley the howling of many wolves. The Count's eyes gleamed, and he said, Listen to them, the children of the night. What music they make. Seeing, I suppose, some expression in my face strange to him, he added, Ah, sir, you dwellers in the city cannot enter into the feelings of the hunter. Then he rose and said, But you must be tired. Your bedroom is all ready, and tomorrow you shall sleep as late as you will. I have to be away till the afternoon, so sleep well and dream well. With a courteous bow, he opened for me himself the door to the octagonal room, and I entered my bedroom. I am all in a sea of wonders. I doubt, I fear, I think strange things which I dare not confess to my own soul. God keep me, if only for the sake of those dear to me. 7 May It is again early morning, but I have rested and enjoyed the last 24 hours. I slept till late in the day and awoke of my own accord. When I addressed myself, I went into the room where we had supped and found a cold breakfast laid out with coffee kept hot by the pot being placed on the hearth. There was a card on the table on which was written, I have to be absent for a while, do not wait for me. D. I set to and enjoyed a hearty meal. When I had done, I looked for a bell, so that I might let the servants know I had finished, but I could not find one. There are certainly odd deficiencies in the house, considering the extraordinary evidences of wealth which are round me. The table service is of gold, and so beautifully wrought that it must be of immense value. The curtains and upholstery of the chairs and sofas and the hangings of my bed are of the costliest and most beautiful fabrics, and must have been of fabulous value when they were made, for they are centuries old, though in excellent order. I saw something like them in Hampton Court, but they were worn and frayed and moth-eaten. But still, in none of the rooms is there a mirror. There is not even a toilette glass on my table and I had to get the little shaving glass from my bag before I could either shave or brush my hair. I have not yet seen a servant anywhere or heard a sound near the castle except the howling of wolves. Sometime after I'd finished my meal, I do not know whether to call it breakfast or dinner, for it was between five and six o'clock when I had it, I looked about for something to read, for I did not like to go about the castle until I had asked the Count's permission. There was absolutely nothing in the room, book, newspaper or even writing materials so i opened another door in the room and found a sort of library the door opposite mine i tried but found it locked in the library i found to my great delight a vast number of english books whole shelves full of them and bound volumes of magazines and newspapers a table in the center was littered with english magazines and newspapers though none of them were of very recent date the books were of the most varied kind history, geography, politics, political economy, botany, geology, law, all relating to England and English life and customs and manners. There were even such books of reference as the London Directory, the Red and Blue Books, Whitaker's Almanac, the Navy, the Army and Navy lists, and, it somehow gladdened my heart to see it, the Law List. While I was looking at the books, the door opened and the Count entered. 
He saluted me in a hearty way and hoped that I had had a good night's rest. Then he went on, I am glad you found your way in here, for I am sure there is much that will interest you. These companions, and he laid his hand on some of the books, have been good friends to me, and for some years past, ever since I had the idea of going to London, have given me many, many hours of pleasure. Through them I have come to know your great England, and to know her is to love her. I long to go through the crowded streets of your mighty London, to be in the midst of the whirl and rush of humanity, to share its life, its change, its death, and all that makes it what it is. But alas, as yet I only know your tongue through books. To you, my friend, I look that I know it to speak. But Count, I said, you know and speak English thoroughly. He bowed gravely. I thank you, my friend, for your all too flattering estimate, but yet I fear that I am but a little way on the road I would travel. True, I know the grammar and the words, but yet I know not how to speak them. Indeed, I said, you speak excellently. Not so, he answered. Well, I know that. Did I move and speak in your London? None there are who would not know me for a stranger. That is not enough for me. Here I am noble, I am boyar. The common people know me and I am master. But a stranger in a strange land, he is no one. Men know him not, and to know not is to care not for. I am content if I am like the rest, so that no man stops if he sees me or pauses in his speaking if he hears my words. Ha ha, a stranger. I have been so long master that I would be master still or at least that none other should be master of me. You come to me not alone, as agent of my friend Peter Hawkins, of Exeter, to tell me all about my new estate in London. You shall, I trust, rest here with me a while, so that by your talking I may learn the English intonation, and I would that you tell me when I make error, even of the smallest, in my speaking. I am sorry that I had to be away so long today. But you will, I know, forgive one who has so many important matters in hand. Of course, I said all I could about being willing, and asked if I might come into that room when I chose. He answered, yes, certainly, and added, you may go anywhere you wish in the castle, except where the doors are locked, where of course you will not wish to go. There is reason that all things are as they are. And did you see with my eyes and know with my knowledge, you would perhaps better understand. I said I was sure of this, and then he went on, We are in Transylvania, and Transylvania is not England. Our ways are not your ways, and there shall be to you many strange things. Nay, from what you have told me of your experiences already, you know something of what strange things there may be. This led to much conversation, and as it was evident that he wanted to talk, if only for talking's sake, I asked him many questions regarding things that had already happened to me or come within my notice. Sometimes he sheared off the subject or turned the conversation by pretending not to understand, but generally he answered all I asked most frankly. Then as time went on and I had got somewhat bolder, I asked him of some of the strange things of the preceding night. As for instance, why the coachman went excuse me, why the coachman went to the places where he had seen the blue flames. He then explained to me that it was commonly believed that on a certain night of the year, last night in fact, when all evil spirits are supposed to have unchecked sway, a blue flame is seen over any place where treasure has been concealed. That treasure has been hidden, he went on, in the region through which you came last night. There can be but little doubt for it was the ground fought over for centuries by the Wallachian, the Saxon, and the Turk. Why, there is hardly a foot of soil in all this region that has not been enriched by the blood of men, patriots, or invaders. In old days there were stirring times when the Austrian and the Hungarian came up in hordes, and the patriots went out to meet them, men and women, the aged and the children too, and waited their coming on the rocks above the passes, that they might sweep destruction on them with their artificial avalanches. When the invader was triumphant, he found but little, for whatever there had been, excuse me, 
for whatever there was had been sheltered in the friendly soil. But how, said I, can it have remained so long undiscovered when there is a sure index to it if men will but take the trouble to look? The Count smiled, and as his lips ran back over his gums, the long, sharp canine teeth showed out strangely. He answered, Because your peasant is at heart a coward and a fool. Those flames only appear on one night, and on that night no man of this land will, if he can help it, stir without his doors. And dear sir, even if he did, he would not know what to do. Why, even the peasant that you tell me of who marked the place of the flame would not know where to look in daylight, even for his own work. Even you would not, I dare be sworn, be able to find those places again. There you are right, I said. I know no more than the dead where even to look for them. Then we drifted into other matters. Come, he said at last, tell me of London and of the house which you have procured for me. With an apology for my remissness, I went into my own room to get the papers from my bag. Whilst I was placing them in order, I heard a rattling of china and silver in the next room, and as I passed through, noticed that the table had been cleared and the lamp lit, for it was by this time deep into the dark. The lamps were also lit in the study or library, and I found the Count lying on the sofa, reading, of all things in the world, an English Bradshaw's Guide. When I came in, he cleared the books and papers from the table, and with him I went into plans and deeds and figures of all sorts. He was interested in everything, and asked me a myriad questions about the place and its surroundings. He clearly had studied beforehand all he could get on the subject of the neighborhood, for he evidently at the end knew very much more than I did. When I remarked this, he answered, Well, but, my friend, is it not needful that I should? When I go there, I shall be all alone. And my friend Harker Jonathan, nay, pardon me, I fall into my country's habit of putting your patronomic first. My friend Jonathan Harker will not be by my side to correct and aid me. He will be in Exeter, miles away, probably working at Papers of the Law with my other friend, Peter Hawkins. So, we went thoroughly into the business of the purchase of the estate at Perfleet. When I had told him the facts and got his signature to the necessary papers, and had written a letter with them ready to post to Mr. Hawkins, he began to ask me how I had come across so suitable a place. I read to him the notes which I had made at the time, and which I inscribe here. At Perfleet, on a by road, I came across just excuse me, I came across just such a place as seemed to be required, and where was displayed a dilapidated notice that the place was for sale. It was surrounded by a high wall of ancient structure, built of heavy stones, and has not been repaired for a large number of years. The closed gates are of heavy old oak and iron, all eaten with rust. The estate is called Carfax, no doubt a corruption of the old Quatrefasse, as the house is four-sided, agreeing with the cardinal points of the compass. It contains in all some twenty acres, quite surrounded by the solid stone wall above mentioned. There are many trees on it which makes it in places gloomy, and there is a deep, dark-looking pond or small lake, evidently fed by some springs, as the water is clear and flows away in a fair-sized stream. The house is very large, and of all periods back, I should say, to medieval times, for one part is of stone immensely thick, with only a few windows high up and heavily barred with iron. It looks like part of a keep, and is close to an old chapel or church. I could not enter it, as I had not the key of the door leading to it from the house, but I have taken with my Kodak views of it from various points. The house had been added to, but in a very straggling way, and I can only guess at the amount of ground it covers, which must be very great. There are but few houses close at hand, one being a very large house only recently added to, and formed into a private lunatic asylum. It is not, however, visible from the grounds. When I had finished, he said, I am glad that it is old and big. I myself am of an old family, and to live in a new house would kill me. A house cannot be made hab habitable in a day, and after all, how few days go to make up a century. I rejoice also that there is a chapel of old times. We Transylvanian nobles love not to think that our bones may lie amongst the common dead. I seek not gaiety nor mirth, 
nor the bright voluptuousness of many excuse me of much sunshine and sparkling waters which please the young and gay i am no longer young and my heart through weary years of mourning over the dead is not attuned to mirth moreover the walls of my castle are broken the shadows are many and the wind breathes cold through the broken battlements and casements i love the shade and the shadow and would be alone with my thoughts when i may somehow his words and his look did not seem to accord or else it was that his cast of face made his smile look malignant and saturnine presently with an excuse he left me pulling me excuse me asking me to pull all my papers together he was some little time away and i began to look at some of the books around me one was an atlas which i found opened naturally to england as if that map had been much used on looking at it i found in certain places little rings marked and on examining these i noticed that one was near london on the east side manifestly where his new estate was situated the other two were exeter and whitby on the yorkshire coast it was the better part of an hour when the count returned aha he said still at your books good but you must not work always come i am informed that your supper is ready he took my arm and we went into the next room where i found an excellent supper ready on the table let's go back a bit because it disconnected again he took my arm and we went into the next room where i found an excellent supper ready on the table the count again excused himself the count again excused himself as he had dined out on his being away from home but as he sat but excuse me but he sat as on the previous night and chatted whilst i ate after supper i smoked as on the last evening and the count stayed with me chatting and asking questions on every conceivable subject hour after hour i felt that it was getting very late indeed but i did not say anything for i felt under obligation to meet my host's wishes in every way i was not sleepy as the long sleep yesterday had fortified me but i could not help experiencing that chill which comes over one at the coming of the dawn which is like in its way the turn of the tide they say that people who are near death die generally at the change to the dawn or at the turn of the tide anyone who has when anyone who has when tired and tied as it were to his post experienced this change in the atmosphere can well believe it all at once we heard the crow of a cock coming up with preternatural shrillness through the clear morning air count dracula jumping to his feet said why there is the morning again how remiss i am to let you stay up so long you must make your conversation regarding my dear new country of england less interesting so that i may not forget how time flies by us and with a courtly bow he quickly left me i went into my room and drew the curtains but there was little to notice my window opened into the courtyard all i could see was the gray the warm gray of quickening sky so i pulled the curtains again and have written of this day 8 May. I began to fear as I wrote in this book that I was getting too diffuse, but now I am glad that I went into detail from the first, for there is something so strange about this place and all in it that I cannot but feel uneasy. I wish there is something so strange about this place and all in it that I cannot but feel uneasy. I wish I were safe out of it or that I had never come. It may be that this strange night existence is telling on me, but would that that were all. If there were anyone to talk to, I could bear it, but there is no one. I have only the Count to speak with, and he, I fear I am myself the only living soul within the place. Let me be prosaic so far as facts can be. It will help me to bear up, and imagination must not run, ri run, run riot with me. If it does, I am lost. Let me say at once how I stand, or seem to. I only slept a few hours when I went to bed, and feeling that I could not sleep any more, got up. I had hung my shaving glass by the window and was just beginning to shave. Suddenly I felt a hand on my shoulder and heard the Count's voice say to me, Good morning. I started, for it amazed me that I had not seen him, since the reflection of the glass covered the whole room behind me. In starting, I had cut myself slightly, but did not notice it at the moment. Having answered the Count's salutation, I turned to the glass again to see how I had been mistaken. 
This time, there could be no error, for the man was close to me, and I could see him over my shoulder. But there was no reflection of him in the mirror. The whole room behind me was displayed, but there was no sign of a man in it except myself. This was startling, and coming on the top of so many strange things was beginning to increase that vague feeling of uneasiness which I always have when the count is near. But at the instant I saw the but at the instant I saw the cut had bled a little, and the blood was trickling over my chin. I laid down the razor, turning as I did so half round to look for some sticking. I laid down the razor, turning as I did so half round to look for some sticking plaster. When the Count saw my face, his eyes blazed with the sort of demonic fury, and he sud When the Count saw my face, his eyes blazed with a sort of demonic fury, and he suddenly made a grab at my throat. I drew away, and his hand touched the string of beads which held the crucifix. It made an instant change in him, for the fury passed so quickly that I could hardly believe that it was ever there. Take care, he said. Take care how you cut yourself. It is more dangerous than you think in this country. Then seizing the shaving glass, he went on, and this is the wretched thing that has done the mischief. It is a foul bauble of man's vanity. Away with it! And opening the heavy window with one wrench of his terrible hand, he flung out the glass, which was shattered into a thousand pieces on the stones of the courtyard far below. Then he withdrew without a word. It is very annoying, for I do not see how I am to shave unless in my watch case or the bottom of the shaving pot, which is fortunately of metal. When I went into the dining room, breakfast was prepared, but I could not find the Count anywhere, so I breakfasted alone. It is strange that as yet I have not seen the Count eat or drink. He must be a very peculiar man. After breakfast, I did a little exploring in the castle. I did a little exploring in the castle. Sorry about all the interruptions. I went out on the stairs and found a room looking towards the south. The view was magnificent, and from where I stood, there was every opportunity of seeing it. The castle is on the very edge of a terrific precipice. A stone falling from the window would fall a thousand feet without touching anything. As far as the eye can reach is a sea of green treetops, with occasionally a deep rift where there is a chasm. Here and there are silver threads where the rivers wind in deep gorges through the forests. But I am not in heart to describe beauty, for when I had seen the view, I explored further. Doors, 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 everywhere, and all locked and bolted. In no place, save from the windows in the castle walls, is there an available exit. The castle is a veritable prison, and I am a prisoner. Okay, so that concludes chapter two. Tomorrow we'll continue with more of Jonathan Harker's journal, set in Castle, Va or castle Dracula. And again, I will try to fix these um, connection issues we're having. I'm so sorry it keeps dropping out, and I hope it's not too annoying when I go back a sentence so that you guys won't miss anything. So thank you very much for joining me today. I hope you're having a great rest of your day, and I will see you tomorrow for more Dracula. Bye. Hey, friends. Hi. It's Christina, the manager at the Pacific Beach Library. We're trying something new today because I forgot my phone at home, so we're using the computer. And so today is day three of our read along together of the Count of, excuse me, our read along together of Dracula. So day three, chapter three, it's going to be fabulous. Clearly, I'm a little discombobulated today. I apologize. So let's start out with some tea. Tea is always a good thing to help settle the nerves, whether you are realizing just a moment before live reading that you forgot your phone at home, or whether you are perhaps getting to know a vampire and quite feeling rather freaked out by the whole experience. So today my tea is a loose leaf Earl Grey tea. It is the Earl Grey de la Creme, which is a lovely Earl Grey. It has a little bit of vanilla flavor added to it and it's delightful. Mm. It's a really fun tea. I like this one a lot. All right, so let's go ahead and get started with a discussion about yesterday's chapter and then we'll get into chapter three, which I peeked ahead just a tiny bit. I'm so sorry. I'm going to try really hard not to peek ahead anymore, but it was so good. Okay. Chapter two, Jonathan Harker's journal. We're continuing a few chapters of Jonathan Harker. We have four days of Jonathan Harker's journal. And 
Yesterday's chapter um, dealt with May 5th and May 6th, I believe it was. And basically in this one, it starts out with um, Jonathan saying how he has arrived at the at Castle, Bam Castle Dracula, the home of Count Dracula, and that, um, you know, just the house is kind of unusual. Um, he speaks a bit with the Count of Monte Cristo. They hear the wolves howling outside, and he mysteriously says, listen to them, the children of the night, what music they make, which I'd heard that quote before uh, from Dracula, and I thought he was actually referring to other vampires rather than to wolves. So I hadn't realized. Um, I also realized I've never seen a classic Dracula film. I've just seen things including vampires and making allusion to Dracula. So ah, this is going to be wonderful. Um, I'm going to get really, we're all going to get really more knowledgeable about Dracula by the end of this reading. Uh, let's see. So on his entry for May 7th, it's kind of interesting, too, because he stays up all night talking with Dracula. He wakes up rather late the following day, and then he has a big breakfast, and he's all alone in the house. He finds the library. Yay, everyone loves the library. Um, he finds the library to his great delight, um, and he finds books and magazines and things like that. Um, and in fact, it turns out that Count Dracula has been rather assiduously learning a lot about England, because when he goes to live at his new home, he wants to be... Um, fluent in the language and, you know, just really knowledgeable about what it's like to live in London. And so he, you know, he, he talks about the city with um, Jonathan Harker and things are going well. The next day, though, things get rather weird in a wonderful way for us as readers, not so much for Jonathan Harker. Um, and when he wakes up, he... He admits he feels uneasy. He's shaving in the morning and he sees, he suddenly feels the hand of the Count on his shoulder. But when he looks in the mirror, he does not see the reflection of the Count. And again, he sort of does that whole thing where he looks behind him, he sees the Count, but he looks in the mirror, he does not see the Count. So we know it's because he's a vampire and vampire reflections don't show, at least in this world, in mirrors. And so, but Jonathan Harker is rather confused by what's going on. He just thinks it's something weird. In the confusion, he cuts himself and blood drips down his chin. When he, that happens, the Count suddenly gets, you know, he his eyes seem to blaze with a demonic fury. He reaches for Jonathan Harker's throat. But when he grabs him, his hand touches the chain of the cru crucifix, which makes him step back. And he basically says, take care of yourself. When you cut yourself, it can be more dangerous than you think in this country. So, hmm, I guess it might be safer to cut yourself when you're not in the home of a vampire. Um, <laughs> he then takes the uh, the the little um, mirror that Jonathan Harker was using to shave with and says, this is the problem. It was vanity. You shouldn't have such a thing. And he literally throws it out the window and destroys Jonathan Harker's mirror. So from there, um, there's a little bit about, you know, him eating breakfast. And then after breakfast, he goes out to look around. And as he looks, he sees this beautiful view. But then he, when he explores the house a bit more, he just finds door after door after door of locked doors. And so, and previously the Count had told him, you're welcome to explore any room of the house, except the rooms with locked doors. So the, ca the chapter two ended with him saying, the castle is a veritable prison and I am a prisoner. So really dramatic. Let's find out what happens in chapter three, where we continue with Jonathan Harker's journal. When I found that I was a prisoner of sort, excuse me, when I found that I was a prisoner, a sort of wild feeling came over me. I rushed up and down the stairs, trying every door and peering out of every window I could find. But after a little, the conviction of my helplessness overpowered all other feelings. When I look back after a few hours, I think I must have been mad for the time, for I behaved much as a rat does in a trap. When, however, the conviction had come to me that I was helpless, I sat down quickly, excuse me, I sat down quietly, as quietly as I have ever done anything in my life, and began to think over what was best to be done. I am thinking still, and as yet have come to no definite conclusion. Of one thing only am I certain, that it is no use making my ideas known to the Count. He knows well that I am imprisoned, and as he has done it himself, and has doubtless his own motives for it, he would only deceive me if I trusted him fully with the facts. 
So far as I can see, my only plan will be to keep my knowledge and my fears to myself and my eyes open. I am, I know, either being deceived, like a baby, by my own fears, or else I am in desperate straits. And if the latter be so, I need, and shall need, all my brains to get through. I had hardly come to this conclusion when I heard the great door below shut, and knew that the Count had returned. He did not come at once into the library, so I went cautiously to my own room and found him making the bed. This was odd, but only confirmed what I had all along thought, that there were no servants in the house. When later I saw him through the chink of the hinges of the door laying the table in the dining room, I was assured of it. For if he does himself all these menial offices, surely it is proof that there is no one else in the castle. It must have been the Count himself who was the driver of the coach that brought me here. This is a terrible thought, for if so, what does it mean that he could control the wolves as he did by only holding up his hand in silence? How was it that all the people at Bistritz and on the coach had some terrible fear for me? What meant the giving of the crucifix, of the garlic, of the wild rose, of the mountain ash? Bless that good, good woman who hung the crucifix round my neck, for it is a comfort and a strength to me whenever I touch it. It is odd that a thing that I have been taught to regard with disfavor and as idolatrous should in a time of loneliness and trouble be of help. Is it that there is something in the essence of the thing itself, or that it is a medium, a tangible help in conveying memories of sympathy and comfort? Some time, if it may be, I must examine this matter and try to make up my mind about it. In the meantime, I must find out all I can about Count Dracula, as it may help me to understand. Tonight, he may talk of himself if I turn the conversation that way. I must be very careful, however, not to awake his suspicion. Midnight. I have had a long talk with the Count. I asked him a few questions on Transylvania history, and he warmed up to the subject wonderfully. In his speaking of things and people, and especially of battles, he spoke as if he had been present to them all. This he afterwards explained by saying that to a boyar, the pride of his house and name is his own pride, that their glory is his glory, that their fate is his fate. Whenever he spoke of his house, he always said we, and spoke almost in the plural, like a king speaking. I wish I could put down all he said exactly as he said it, for to me it was most fascinating. He seemed to have in it a whole history of the country. He grew excited as he spoke and walked about the room, pulling his great white moustache and grasping anything on which he laid his hands, as though he would crush it by main strength. One thing he said which I shall put down as nearly as I can, for it tells in its way the story of his race. We skellies have a right to be proud, for in our veins flows the blood of many brave races who fought as the lion fights for lordship. Here in the whirlpool of European races, the Ugric tribe bore down from Iceland the fighting spirit which Thor and Woden gave them, which their berserkers displayed to such fell intent on the seaboards of Europe, aye, and of Asia and Africa too, till the people thought that the werewolves themselves had come. Here too, when they came, they found the Huns, whose warlike fury had swept the earth like a living flame till the dying peoples held that in their veins ran the blood of those old witches, who, expelled from Scythia, had mated with the devils in the desert. Fools, fools! What devil or what witch was ever so great as Attila, whose blood is in these veins? He held up his arms. Is it a wonder that we were a conquering race? that we were proud, that when the Magyar, the Lombard, the Avar, the Bulgar, or the Turk poured his thousands on our frontiers, we drove them back? Is it strange that when Arpad and his legions swept through the Hungarian fatherland, he found us here when he reached the frontier, that the Hanfaglalas was com completed there? And when the Hungarian flood swept eastward, the Skellies were claimed as kindred by the victorious Magyars, and to us for centuries was trusted the guarding of the frontier of Turkey land. Aye, and more than that, endless duty of the frontier guard, for as the Turks say, water sleeps, an enemy 
is sleepless. Who more gladly than we throughout the first na throughout the four nations received the bloody sword, or at its warlike call flocked quicker to the standard of the king? When was redeemed that great shame of my nation, the shame of Kasova, when the flags of the Wallach and the Magyar went down through the crescent? Who was it but one of my own race, who as Voj Voivode crossed the Danube and beat the Turk on his own ground? This was a Dracula indeed. Woe was it that his own unworthy brother, when he had fallen, sold his people to the Turk and brought the shame of slavery on them. Was it not this Dracula, indeed, who inspired that other of his race, who in a later age again and again brought his forces over the great river into Turkey land? Who, when he was beaten back, came again and again, though he had to come alone from the bloody field where his troops were being slaughtered, since he knew that he alone could ultimately triumph. They said that he thought only of himself. Bah, what good are peasants without a leader? Where ends the war without a brain and heart to conduct it? Again, when after the battle of Mohawks, we threw off the Hungarian yoke, we of the Dracula blood were amongst their leaders, for our spirit would not brook that we were not free. Ah, young sir, the Skellies, the Zekelis, excuse me, and the Dracula as their heart's blood, their brains, and their swords can boast a record that mushroom growths like the Habsburgs and the Romanovs can never reach. The warlike days are over. Blood is too precious a thing in these days of dishonorable peace, and the glories of the great races are as a tale that is told. It was by this time close on morning, and we went to bed. Memo, this diary seems horribly like the beginning of the Arabian Nights, for everything has to break off at cockcrow, or like the ghost of Hamlet's father. 12 May. Let me begin with facts, bare, meager facts, verified by books and figures, and of which there can be no doubt. I must not confuse them with experiences which will have to rest on my own observation or my memory of them. Last evening, when the Count came from his room, he began by asking me questions on legal matters and on the doing of certain kinds of business. I had spent the day wearily over books, and simply to keep my mind occupied, went over some of the matters I had been examined uh, went over some of the matters I had been examined in at Lincoln's Inn. There was a certain method in the Count's inquiries, so I shall try to put them down in sequence. The knowledge may somehow or some time be useful to me. First, he asked if a man in England might have two solicitors or more. I told him he might have a dozen if he wished, but that it would not be wise to have more than one solicitor engaged in one transaction, as only one could act at a time, and that to change would be certain to mitigate against his interest. Excuse me, as to militate against his interest. He seemed thoroughly to understand and went on to ask if there would be any practical difficulty in having one man to attend say, to banking, and another to look after shipping in case local help were needed in a place far from the home of the banking solicitor. I asked him to explain more fully so that I might not by any chance mislead him, and he said, I shall illustrate. Your friend and mine, Mr. Peter Hawkins, from under the shadow of your beautiful cathedral at Exeter, which is far from London, buys for me, through your good self, my place at London. Good. Now, here, let me say frankly, lest you should think it strange that I have sought the services of one so far off from London, instead of some one resident there, that my motive was that no local interest might be served save my wish only. And as one of London residents might, perhaps, have some purpose of himself or friend to serve, I went thus afield to seek my, to seek my agent, whose labors should be only to my interest. Now, suppose I, who have much of affairs, wish to ship goods, say, to Newcastle, or Durham, or Harwich, or Dover, might it not be that it could with more ease be done by consigning to one in these ports? I answered that certainly it would be most easy, but that we solicitors had a system of agency, one for the other, so that local work could be done locally on instruction from any solicitor, so that the client, simply placing himself in the hands of one man, could have his wishes carried out by him without further trouble. But, said he, I could be at liberty to direct myself, 
Is it not so? Of course, I replied, and such is often done by men of business, who do not like the whole of their affairs to be known by any one person. Good, he said. And then went on to ask about the means of making consignments, and the forms to be gone through, and of all sorts of difficulties which might arise, but by forethought could be guarded against. I explained all these things to him to the best of my ability, and he certainly left me under the impression that he would have made a wonderful solicitor, for there was nothing that he did not think of or foresee. For a man who was never in the country, and who did not evidently do much in the way of business, his knowledge and acumen were wonderful. When he had settled himself on these points of which we had spoken, and I had verified all as well as I could by the books available, he suddenly stood up and said, Have you written your first letter to our friend, Mr. Peter Hawkins, or to any other? It was with some bitterness in my heart that I answered that I had not, that as yet I had not seen any opportunity of sending letters to anybody. Then write now, my young friend, he said, laying a heavy hand on my shoulder, write to our friend and to any other, and say, if it will please you, that you shall stay with me until a month from now. Do you wish me to stay so long? I asked, for my heart grew cold at the thought. I desire it much. Nay, I will take no refusal. When your master, employer, what you will, engaged that someone should come on his behalf, it was understood that my needs only were to be consulted. I have not stinted. Is it not so? What could I do but bow acceptance? It was Mr. Hawkins' interest, not mine, and I had to think of him, not myself. And besides, while Count Dracula was speaking, there was that in his eyes and in his bearing which made me, made me remember that I was a prisoner, and that if I wished it, I could have no choice. The Count saw his victory in my bow, and his mastery in the trouble of my face, for he began at once to use them, but in his own smooth, resistless way. I pray you, my good young friend, that you will not discourse of things other than business in your letters. It will doubtless please your friends to know that you are well, and that you look forward to getting home to them. Is it not so? As he spoke, he handed me three sheets of note paper and three envelopes. They were all of the thinnest foreign post, and looking at them, then at him, and noticing his quiet smile with the sharp canine teeth lying over the red underlip, I understood as well as if he had spoken that I should be more careful what I wrote, for he would be able to read it. So I determined to write only formal letters now, but to write fully to Mr. Hawkins in secret and also to Mina, for to her I could write in shorthand, which would puzzle the Count, if he did see it. When I had written my two letters, I sat quiet, reading a book, whilst the Count wrote several notes, referring as he wrote them to some books on his table. And then he took up my two and placed them with his own and put by his writing materials. After which, the instant the door had closed behind him, I leaned over and looked at the letters, which were face down on the table. I felt no compunction in, in doing so, for under the circumstances, I felt that I should protect myself in every way I could. One of the letters was directed to Samuel F. Billington, number seven, The Crescent, Whitby. Another to Herr Leutner, Varna. The third was to Coots and Company, London. And the fourth to Heron Klopstock and Bill Ruth, Bankers, Budapest. The second and fourth were unsealed. I was just about to look at them when I saw the door handle move. I sank back in my seat, having just had time to replace the letters as they had been, and to resume my book before the Count, holding still another letter in his hand, entered the room. He took up the letters on the table and stamped them carefully, and then turning to me said, I trust you will forgive me, but I have much work to do in private this evening. You will, I hope, find all things as you wish. As he turned, as at the door he turned, and after a moment's pause said, Let me advise you, my dear young friend. Nay, let me warn you with all seriousness, that should you leave these rooms, you will not by any chance go to sleep in any other part of the castle. It is old and has many memories, and there are bad dreams for those who sleep unwisely. Be warned. Should sleep now or ever overcome you, or be like to do,
then haste to your own chamber or to these rooms, for your rest will then be safe. But if you be not careful in this respect, then... He finished his speech in a gruesome way, for he motioned with his hands as if he were washing them. I quite understood. My only doubt was as to whether any dream could be more terrible than the unnatural, excuse me, than the unnatural, horrible net of gloom and mystery which seemed closing around me. Later, I endorse the last words written, but this time there is no doubt in question. I shall not fear to sleep in any place where he is not. I have placed the crucifix over the head of my bed. I imagine that my rest is thus freer from dreams, and there it shall remain. When he left me, I went to my room. After a little while, not hearing any sound, I came out and went up the stone stair to where I could look out towards the south. There was some sense of freedom in the vast expanse, inaccessible though it was to me as compared with the narrow darkness of the courtyard. Looking out on this, I felt that I was indeed in prison, and I seemed to want a breath of fresh air, though it were of the night. I am beginning to feel this I am beginning to feel this nocturnal existence tell on me. It is destroying my nerve. I start in my own shadow and am full of all sorts of horrible imaginings. God knows that there is ground for my terrible fear in this accursed place. I looked out over the beautiful expanse bathed in soft yellow moonlight till it was almost as light as day. In the soft light, the distant hills became melted and the shadows in the valleys and gorges of velvety blackness. The mere beauty seemed to cheer me. There was peace and comfort in every breath I drew. As I leaned from the window, my eye was caught by something moving a story below me and somewhat to my left, where I imagined from the order of the rooms that the windows of the Count's own room would look out. The window at which I stood was tall and deep, stone mill mullioned, and through, and though weather-worn, was still complete. But it was evidently many a day since the case had been there. I drew back behind the stonework and looked carefully out. What I saw was the Count's head coming out from the window. I did not see the face, but I knew the man by the neck and the movement of his back and arms. In any case, I could not mistake the hands, which I had had so many opportunities of studying. I was at first interested and somewhat amused, for it is wonderful how small a matter will interest and amuse a man when he is a prisoner. But my very feelings changed to repulsion and terror when I saw the whole man slowly emerge from the window and begin to crawl down the castle wall over the dreadful abyss, face down with his cloak spreading out around him like great wings. At first I could not believe my eyes. I thought it was some trick of the moonlight, some weird effect of shadow. But I kept looking, and it could be no delusion. I saw the fingers and toes grasp the corners of the stones, worn clear of the mortar by the stress of years, and by thus using every projection and inequality, move downwards with considerable speed just as a lizard moves along a wall. What manner of man is this? Or what manner of creature is it in the semblance of man? I feel the dread of this horrible place overpowering me. I am in fear, in awful fear, and there is no escape for me. I am encompassed about with terrors that I dare not think of. Fifteen May. Once more, I have seen the count go out. I have seen the count go out in his lizard fashion. He moved downwards in a side long way, some hundred feet down and a good deal to the left. He vanished into some hole or window. When his head had disappeared, I leaned out to try and see more, but without avail. The distance was too great to allow a proper angle of sight. I knew he had left the castle now, and thought to use the opportunity to explore more than I had dared to do as yet. I went back to the room, and taking a lamp, tried all the doors. They were all locked, as I had expected, and the locks were comparatively new. But I went down the stone stairs to the hall where I had entered originally. I found I could pull back the bolts easily enough, and unhook the great chains. But the door was locked, and the key was gone. That key must be in the Count's room. 
I must watch should his door be unlocked so that I may get it and escape. I went on to make a thorough examination of the various stairs and passages and to try the doors that opened from them. One or two small rooms near the hall were open, but there was nothing to see in them except old furniture, dusty with age and moth-eaten. At last, however, I found one door at the top of the stairway which, though it seemed to be locked, gave a little under pressure. I tried it harder and found that it was not really locked, but that the resistance came from the fact that the hinges had fallen somewhat and the heavy door rested on the floor. Here was an opportunity which I might not have again, so I exerted myself and with many efforts forced it back so that I could enter. I was now in a wing of the castle further to the right than the rooms I knew and a story lower down. From the windows I could see that the suite of rooms lay along to the south of the castle the windows of the end room looking out both west and south. On the latter side, as well as to the former, there was a great precipice. The castle was built on the corner of a great rock, so that on three sides it was quite impregnable, and great windows were placed here where sling or bow or culverin could not reach, and consequently light and comfort, impossible to a position which had to be guarded, were secure. To the west was a great valley, and then, rising far away, great jagged mountain fastnesses rising peak on peak, the sheer rock studded with mountain ash and thorn, whose roots clung in cracks and crevices and crannies of the stone. This was evidently the portion of the castle occupied by the ladies in bygone days, for the furniture had more air of comfort than any I had seen. The windows were curtainless, and the yellow moonlight flooding in through the diamond panes enabled one to see even colors, whilst it softened the wealth of dust which lay over all and disguised in some measure the ravages of time and the moth. My lamp seemed to be of little effect in the brilliant moonlight, but I was glad to have it with me, for there was a dread loneliness in the place which chilled my heart and made my nerves tremble. Still, it was better than living alone in the rooms which I had come to hate from the presence of the Count, and after trying a little to school my nerves, I found a soft quietude come over me. Here I am, sitting at a little oak table, where in old times possibly some fair lady sat to pen, with much thought and many blushes, her ill-spelt love letter, and writing in my diary in shorthand all that has happened since I closed it last. It is 19th century up to date with a vengeance, and yet, unless my senses deceive me, the old centuries had, and have, powers of their own which mere modernity cannot kill. Later, the morning of 16 May. God preserve my sanity, for to this I am reduced. Safety and the assurance of safety are things of the past. Whilst I live on here, there is but one thing to hope for, that I may not go mad, if indeed I be not mad already. If I be sane, then surely it is maddening to think that of all the foul things that lurk in this hateful place, the Count is the least dreadful to me, that to him alone I can look for safety, even though this be only whilst I can serve his purpose? Great God, merciful God! Let me be calm, for out of that way lies madness indeed. I begin to get new lights on certain things which have puzzled me. Up to now, I never quite knew what Shakespeare meant when he made Hamlet say, My tablets, quick my tablets, tis meet that I put it down, etc. For now, feeling as though my own brain were unhinged, or as if the shock had come which must end in its undoing, I turn to my diary for repose. The habit of entering accurately must help to soothe me. The Count's mysterious warning frightened me at the time. It frightens me more now when I think of it, for in the future he has a fearful hold upon me. I shall fear to doubt what he may say. When I had written in my diary and had fortunately replaced the book and pen in my pocket, I felt sleepy. The Count's warning came into my mind, but I took a pleasure in disobeying it. The sense of sleep was upon me, and with it the obstinacy which sleep brings as outrider. The soft moonlight soothed, and the wide expanse without gave a sense of freedom which refreshed me. I determined not to return tonight to the gloom-haunted rooms, but to sleep here, where of old 
Ladies had sat and sung and lived sweet lives whilst their gentle breasts were sad for their menfolk away in the midst of remorseless wars. I drew a great couch out of its place near the corner so that as I lay, I could look at the lovely view to east and south and unthinking of and uncaring for the dust, composed myself for sleep. I suppose I must have fallen asleep. I hope so. But I fear for all that followed was startlingly real, so real that now, sitting here in the broad, full sunlight of the morning, I cannot in the least believe that it was all sleep. I was not alone. The room was the same, unchanged in any way since I came into it. I could see along the floor in the brilliant moonlight my own footsteps marked where I had disturbed the long accumulation of dust. In the moonlight opposite me were three young women, ladies by their dress and manner. I thought at the time that I must be dreaming when I saw them, for though the moonlight was behind them, they threw no shadow on the floor. They came close to me and looked at me for some time and then whispered together. Two were dark and had high aquiline noses like the Count and great dark piercing eyes that seemed to be almost red when contrasted with the pale yellow moon. The other was fair, as fair as can be, with great wavy masses of golden hair and eyes like pale sapphires. I seemed somehow to know her face and to know it in connection with some dreamy fear, but I could not recollect at the moment how or where. All three had brilliant white teeth that shone like pearls against the ruby of their voluptuous lips. There was something about them that made me uneasy, some longing, and at the same time, some deadly fear. I felt in my heart a wicked, burning desire that they would kiss me with those red lips. It is not good to note this down, lest some day it should meet Mina's eyes and cause her pain. But it is the truth. They whispered together, and then they all three laughed. Such a silvery, musical laugh, but as hard as though the sound never could have come through the softness of human lips. It was like the intolerable, tingling sweetness of water glasses when played on by a cunning hand. The fair girl shook her head coquettishly, and the other two urged her on. One said, Go on, you are first, and we shall follow. Yours is the right to begin. The other added, He is young and strong. There are kisses for us all. I lay quiet, looking out under my eyelashes in an agony of delightful anticipation. The fair girl advanced and bent over me till I could feel the movement of her breath upon me. Sweet it was in one sense, honey sweet, and sent the same tingling through the nerves as her voice, but with a bitter underlying the sweet, a bitter offensiveness as one smells in blood. I was afraid to raise my eyelids, but looked out and saw perfectly under the lashes. The girl went on her knees and bent over me, simply gloating. There was a deliberate voluptuous voluptuousness, which was both, there was a deliberate voluptuousness, which was both thrilling and repulsive. And as she arched her neck, she actually licked her lips like an animal till I could see in the moonlight the moisture shining on the scarlet lips and on the red tongue as it lapped the sharp white teeth. Lower and lower went her head as the lips went below the range of my mouth and chin and seemed to fasten on my throat. Then she paused and I could hear the churning sound of her tongue as it licked her teeth and lips and I could feel the hot breath on my neck then the skin of my throat began to tingle as one's flesh does when the hand that is to tickle it approaches nearer, nearer. I could feel the soft shivering touch of the lips on the super sensitive skin of my throat and the hard dents of two sharp teeth just touching and pausing there. I closed my eyes in languorous ecstasy and waited, waited with beating heart. But at that instant, another sensation swept through me as quick as lightning. I was conscious of the presence of the Count and of his being as if lapped in a storm of fury. As my eyes opened involuntarily, I saw his strong hand grasp the slender neck of the fair woman and with giant's power draw it back 
The blue eyes transformed with fury, the white teeth champing with rage, and the fair cheeks blazing red with passion. But the Count, never did I imagine such wrath and fury, even to the demons of the pit. His eyes were positively blazing. The red light in them was lurid, as if the flames of hellfire blazed behind them. His face was deathly pale, and the lines of it were drawn, excuse me, and the lines of it were hard, like drawn wires. The thick eyebrows that met over the nose now seemed like a heaving bar of white-hot metal. With a fierce sweep of his arm, he hurled the woman from him, and then motioned to the others, as though he were beating them back. It was the same imperious gesture that I had seen used to the wolves. In a voice which, though low and almost in a whisper, seemed to cut through the air and then ring around the room, he said, How dare you touch him, any of you? How dare you cast eyes on him when I had forbidden it? Back, I tell you all, this man belongs to me. Beware how you meddle with him or you'll have to deal with me. The fair girl with a laugh of ribald coquetry, co coquetry turned to answer him, you yourself never loved, you never love. On this, the other women joined and such a mirthless, hard, soulless laughter rang through the room that it almost made me faint to hear. It seemed like the pleasure of fiends. Then the count turned after looking at my face attentively and said in a soft whisper, yes. I too can love. You yourselves can tell it from the past. Is it not so? Well, now I promise you that when I am done with him, you shall kiss him at your will. Now go, go. I must awaken him for there is work to be done. Are we to have nothing tonight? Said one of them with a low laugh as she pointed to the bag which he had thrown upon the floor and which moved as though there were some living thing within it. For answer, he nodded his head. One of the women jumped forward and opened it. If my ears did not deceive me, there was a gasp and a low wail, as of a half-smothered child. The women closed round, whilst I was aghast with horror. But as I looked, they disappeared, and with them, the dreadful bag. There was no door near them, and they could not have passed me without my noticing. They simply seemed to fade into the rays of the moonlight and pass out through the window, for I could see outside the dim, shadowy forms for a moment before they entirely faded away. Then the horror overcame me, and I sank down, unconscious. And that concludes chapter three of Jonathan Harker's journal. Um, things are getting a little weirder in Castle of Dracula. We'll learn more. We'll talk a bit about it tomorrow and we'll go on to our next chapter, which will conclude the section of Jonathan Harker's journal. Um, thank you very much for joining me today. Today was rather a nicely spooky day. Um, okay, we'll talk about it more tomorrow. Thank you very much. I hope you had a great day and that it will continue to be a wonderful day for you. Bye. Hmm. Or at any rate of being able to send word home. A band of Zegani have come to the castle and are encamped in the courtyard. These Zegani are gypsies. I have notes of them in my book. They are peculiar to this part of the world, though allied to the ordinary gypsies all the world over. There are thousands of them in Hungary and Transylvania who are almost outside all law. They attach themselves as a rule to some great noble or boyar and call themselves by his name. They are fearless and without religion, save superstition, and they talk only their own varieties of the Romani tongue. I shall write some letters home and shall try to get them to have them posted. I have already spoken to them through my window to begin acquaintanceship. They took their hats off and made obeisance in many signs, which, however, I could not understand any more than I could their spoken language. I have written the letters. Mina's is in shorthand and I simply ask Mr. Hawkins to communicate with her. To her, I have explained my situation, but without the horrors which I may only surmise, it would shock and frighten her to death were I to expose my heart to her. Should the letters not carry, then the Count shall not know my secret or the extent of my knowledge. I have given the letters. 
I threw them through the bars of my window with a gold piece and made what signs I could to have them posted. The man who took them pressed them to his heart and bowed and then put them in his cap. I could do no more. I stole back to the study and began to read. As the count did not come in, I have written here. The count has come. He sat down beside me and said in his smoothest voice as he opened two letters, The Segony has given me these, of which, though I know not whence they come, I shall, of course, take care. See? He must have looked at it. One is from you, and to my friend Peter Hawkins. The other... Here he caught sight of the strange symbols as he opened the envelope, and the dark look came into his face, and his eyes blazed wickedly. The other is a vile thing, an outrage upon friendship and hospitality. It is not signed. Well, so it cannot matter to us. And he calmly held letter and envelope in the flame of the lamp till they were consumed. Then he went on. The letter to Hawkins. That I shall, of course, send on, since it is yours. Your letters are sacred to me. Your pardon, my friend, that unknowingly I did break the seal. Will you not cover it again? He held out the letter to me, and with a courteous bow handed me a, queen, a clean envelope. I could only redirect it and hand it to him in silence. When he went out of the room, I could hear the key turn softly. A minute later, I went over and tried it, and the door was locked. When, an hour or two later, the Count came quietly into the room, his coming awakened me, for I had gone to sleep on the sofa. He was very courteous and very cheery in his manner, and seeing that I had been sleeping, he said, So, my friend, you are tired. Get to bed. There is the surest rest. I may not have the pleasure to talk tonight, since there are many labors to me, but you will sleep, I pray. I passed to my room and went to bed, and, strange to say, slept without dreaming. Despair had its own calms. 31 May This morning when I woke, I thought I would provide myself with some papers and envelopes from my bag and keep them in my pocket, so that I might write in case I should get an opportunity. But again, a surprise. Again, a shock. Every scrap of paper was gone, and with it all my notes, my memoranda relating to railways and travel, my letter of credit, in fact, all that might be useful to me were I once outside the castle. I sat and pondered a while, and then some thought occurred to me, and I made search of my portmanteau and in the wardrobe where I had placed my clothes. The suit in which I had traveled was gone, and also my overcoat and rug. I could find no trace of them anywhere, this looked like some new scheme of villainy. 17 June. This morning, as I was sitting on the edge of my bed, cudgeling my brains, I heard without a crackling of whips and pounding and... I heard without a crackling of whips and pounding and scraping of horses' feet off the rocky path beyond the, count, beyond the courtyard. With joy, I hurried to the window and saw drive into the yard two great lighter wagons, each drawn by eight steady horses, and at the head of each pair a Slovak, with his wide hat, great nail-studded belt, dirty sheepskin, and high boots. They had also their long staves in hand. I ran to the door, intending to descend and try and join them through the main hall, as I thought that way might be opened for them. Again, a shock. My door was fastened on the outside. Then I ran to the window and cried out to them. They looked up at me stupidly and pointed, but just then the hetman of the Zegany came out, and seeing them pointing to my window, said something, at which they laughed. Henceforth, no effort of mine, no piteous cry or agonized entreaty would make them even look at me. They resolutely turned away. The lighter wagons contained great square boxes with handles of thick rope, these were evidently empty by the ease with which the Slovaks handled them and by their resonance as they were roughly moved. When they were all unloaded and packed in a great heap in one corner of the yard, the Slovaks were given some money by the Zegany, and spitting on it for luck, lazily went each to his horse's head. Shortly afterwards, I heard the crackling of their whips die away in the distance. 24 June, before morning. 
Last night, the Count left me early and locked himself into his own room. As soon as I dared, I ran up the winding stair and looked out of the window, which opened south. I thought I would watch for the Count, for there is something going on. The Zagany are quartered somewhere in the castle and are doing some work of some and are doing work of some kind. I know it, for now and then I hear a faraway muffled sound as of mattock and spade, and whatever it is, it must be the end of some ruthless villainy. I had been at the window somewhat less than half an hour when I saw something coming out of the Count's window. I drew back and watched carefully and saw the whole man emerge. It was a new shock to me to find that he had on the suit of clothes which I had worn whilst traveling here, and slung over his shoulder the terrible bag which I had seen the women take away. There could be no doubt as to his quest, and in my garb, too. This, then, is his new scheme of evil, that he will allow others to see me, as they think, so that he may both leave evidence that I have been seen in the towns or villages posting my own letters, and that any wickedness which he may do shall by the local people be attributed to me. It makes me rage to think that this can go on, and whilst I am shut up here, a veritable prisoner, but without that protection of the law which is a criminal's right and consolation. I thought I would watch for the Count's return, and for a long time sat doggedly at the window. Then I began to notice that there were some quaint little specks floating in the rays of the moonlight. They were like the tiniest grains of dust, and they whirled round and gathered in clusters in a nebulous sort of way. I watched them with a sense of soothing, and a sort of calm stole over me. I leaned back in the embrasure in a more comfortable position, so that, I could full, so that I could enjoy more fully the aerial gambling. Something made me start up, a low, piteous howling of dogs somewhere far below in the valley, which was hidden from my sight. Lower it seemed to ring in my ears, and the floating motes of dust to take new shapes to the sound as they danced in the moonlight. I felt myself struggling to awake to some call of my instincts, Nay, my very soul was struggling, and my half-remembered sensibilities were striving to answer the call. I was becoming hypnotized. Quicker and quicker danced the dust. The moonbeams seemed to quiver as they went by me into a mass of gloom beyond. More and more they gathered till they seemed to take dim phantom shapes. And then I started, broad awake and in full possession of my senses, and ran screaming from the place. The phantom shapes, which were, gradually, which were becoming gradually materialized from the moonbeams, were those of the three ghostly women to whom I was doomed. I fled, and felt somewhat safer in my own room, where there was no moonlight and where the lamp was burning brightly. When a couple of hours had passed, I heard something stirring in the Count's room, something like a sharp wail quickly suppressed, and then there was silence, deep, awful silence which chilled me. With a beating heart, I tried the door, but I was locked in my prison and could do nothing. I sat down and simply cried. As I sat, I heard a sound in the courtyard without, the agonized cry of a woman. I rushed to the window and throwing it up, peered out between the bars. There indeed was a woman with disheveled hair, holding her hands over her heart as one distressed with running. She was leaning against the corner of the gateway. When she saw my face at the window, she threw herself forward and shouted in a voice laden with menace, Monster, give me my child. She threw herself on her knees and raising up her hands, cried the same words in tones which wrung my heart. Then she tore her hair and beat her breast and abandoned herself to all the violences of extravagant emotion. Finally, she threw herself forward, and though I could not see her, I could hear the beating of her naked hands against the door. Somewhere high overhead, probably on the tower, I heard the voice of the Count calling in his harsh, metallic whisper. His call seemed to be answered from far and wide by the howling of wolves. Before many minutes had passed, a pack of them purred like a pent-up dam when liberated through the wide entrance, or sorry, his call seemed to be answered from far and wide by the howling of wolves. Before many minutes had passed, a pack of them poured like a pent-up dam when liberated through the wide entrance into the courtyard. There was no cry from the woman, and the howling of the wolves was but short. 
Before long, they streamed away singly, licking their lips. I could not pity her, for I knew now what had become of her child, and she was better dead. What shall I do? What can I do? How can I escape from this dreadful thing of night and gloom and fear? 25 June, morning. No man knows till he has suffered from the night how sweet and clear how sweet and how dear to his heart and eye the morning can be. When the sun grew so high this morning that it struck the top of the great gateway opposite my window, the high spot which it touched seemed to me as if the dove from the ark had lighted there. My fear fell from me as if it had been a vaporous garment which dissolved in the warmth. I must take action of some sort whilst the courage of the day is upon me. Last night, one of my post-dated letters went to post, the first of that fatal series which is to blot out the very traces of my existence from the earth. Let me not think of it. Action! It has always been at night time that I have been molested or threatened, or in some way in danger or in fear. I have not yet seen the Count in the daylight. Can it be that he sleeps when others wake, that he may be awake whilst they sleep? If I could only get into his room, but there is no possible way. The door is always locked, no way for me. Yet there is a way, if one dares to take it. Where his body has gone, why may not another body go? I have seen him myself crawl from his window. Why should not I imitate him and go in by his window? The chances are desperate, but my need is more desperate still. I shall risk it. At the worst, it can only be death, and a man's death is not a cab's, and the dreaded hereafter may still be open to me. God help me in my task. Goodbye, Mina, if I fail. Goodbye, my faithful friend and second father. Goodbye, all, and last of all, Mina. Same day later. I have made the effort, and, God helping me, have come safely back to this room. I must put down every detail in order. I went whilst my courage was fresh, straight to the window on the south side, and at once got outside on this side. The stones are big and roughly cut, and the mortar has by process of time been washed away between them. I took off my, boot, my boots and ventured out on the desperate way. I looked down once, so as to make sure that a sudden glimpse of the awful depth would not overcome me but after that kept my eyes away from it. I know pretty well the direction and distance of the Count's window and made for it as well as I could, having regard to the opportunities available. I did not feel dizzy. I suppose I was too excited and the time to seem ridiculously short till I found myself standing on the windowsill and trying to raise up the sash. I was filled with agitation. However, when I bent down and slid feet foremost into the window, then I looked around for the Count but, with surprise and gladness, made a discovery. The room was empty. It was barely furnished with odd things, which seemed to have never been used. The furniture was something the same style as that in the south rooms and was covered with dust. I looked for the key, but it was not in the lock, and I could not find it anywhere. The only thing I found was a great heap of gold in one corner. Gold of all kinds. Roman and British and Austrian and Hungarian and Greek and Turkish money covered with a film of dust as though it had laid long in the ground. None of it that I noticed was less than 300 years old. There were also chains and ornaments, some jeweled, but all of them old and stained. At one corner of the room was a heavy door. I tried it, for since I could not find the key of the room or the key of the outer door, which was the main object of my search, I must make further examination or all my efforts would be in vain. It was open and led through a stone passage to a circular stairway, which went steeply down. I descended, minding carefully where I went for the stairs were dark, being, lit, being only lit by loopholes in the heavy masonry. At the bottom there was a dark tunnel-like passage through which came a deathly, sickly odor, the odor of old earth newly turned. As I went through the passage, the smell grew closer and heavier. 
At last, I pulled open a heavy door which stood ajar, and found myself in an old ruined chapel, which was evident, which had evidently been used as a graveyard. The roof was broken, and in two places were steps leading to vaults, but the ground had recently been dug over, and the earth placed in great wooden boxes, manifestly those which had been brought by the Slovaks. There was nothing about, and I made a search over every inch of the ground so as not to lose a chance. I went down even into the vaults where the dim light struggled, although to do so was a dread to my very soul. Into two of these I went, but saw nothing except fragments of old coffins and piles of dust. In the third, however, I made a discovery. There, in one of the great boxes, of which there were fifty in all, on a pile of newly dug earth, lay the count. He was either dead or asleep. I could not say which, for the eyes were open and stony, but without the glassiness of death, and the cheeks had the warmth of life through all their pallor. The lips were as red as ever, but there was no sign of movement, no pulse, no breath, no beating of the heart. I bent over him and tried to find any sign of life, but in vain. He could not have lain there long, for the earthly smell would have passed away in a few hours. By the side of the box was its cover, pierced with holes here and there. I thought he might have the keys on him, but when I went to search, I saw the dead eyes, and in them, dead though they were, such a look of hate, though unconscious of me or my presence, that I fled from the place, and leaving the Count's room by the window, crawled again up the castle wall. Regaining my room, I threw myself panting upon the bed and tried to think. Twenty-nine June. Today is the date of my last letter, and the Count has taken steps to prove that it was genuine, for again I saw him leave the castle by the same window and in my clothes. As he went down the wall, lizard fashion, I wished I had a gun or some lethal weapon that I might destroy him but I fear that no weapon wrought alone by man's hand would have any effect on him. I dared not wait to see him return, for I feared to see those weird sisters. I came back to the library and read there till I fell asleep. I was awakened by the Count, who looked at me as grimly as a man could look as he said, Tomorrow, my friend, we must part. You return to your beautiful England, I to some work which may have such an end that we may never meet. Your letter home has been dispatched. Tomorrow I shall not be here, but all shall be ready for your journey. In the morning come the Segany, who have some labors of their own here, and also come some Slovaks. When they have gone, my carriage shall come for you and shall bear you to the Borgo Pass to meet the diligence from Bukovina to Bistritz. But I am in hopes that I shall see more of you at Castle Dracula. I suspected him and determined to test, his, to test his sincerity. Sincerity? It seems like a, pro a profanation of the word to write it in connection with such a monster. So I asked him point blank, why may I not go tonight? Because, dear sir, my coachman and horses are away on a mission. But I would walk with pleasure. I want to get away at once. He smiled, such a soft, smooth, diabolical smile that I knew there was some trick behind his smoothness. He said, and your baggage? I do not care about it. I can send for it some other time. The Count stood up and said with a sweet courtesy, which made me rub my eyes. It seemed so real. You English have a saying which is close to my heart, for its spirit is that which rules our boyars. Welcome the coming, speed the parting guest. Come with me, my dear young friend. Not an hour shall you wait in my house against your will, though sad am I at your going, and that you so suddenly desire it. Come. With a stately gravity, he, with the lamp, preceded me down the stairs and along the hall. Suddenly he stopped. Hark! Close at hand came the howling of many wolves. It was almost as if the sound sprang up at the rising of his hand, just as the music of a great orchestra seems to leap under the baton of the conductor. After a pause of a moment, he proceeded in his stately way to the door, threw back the ponderous bolts, 
unhooked the heavy chains and began to draw it open. To my intense astonishment, I saw that it was unlocked. Suspiciously, I looked all around, but could see no key of any kind. As the door began to open, the howling of the wolves without grew louder and angrier. Their red jaws with champing teeth and their blunt clawed feet as they leapt came in through the opening door. I knew then that to struggle at the moment against the Count was useless. With such allies as these at his command, I could do nothing. But still the door continued slowly to open, and only the Count's body stood in the gap. Suddenly, it struck me that this might be the moment and means of my doom. I was to be given to the wolves, and at my own instigation. There was a diabolical wickedness in the idea, great enough for the Count, and as, I la and as a last chance I cried out, Shut the door! I shall wait till morning! And covered my face with my hands to hide my tears of bitter disappointment. With one sweep of his powerful arm, the Count threw the door shut, and the great bolts clanged and echoed through the hall as they shot back into their places. In silence, we returned to the library, and after a minute or two, I went to my own room. The last I saw of Count Dracula was his kissing his hand to me with a red light of triumph in his eyes and with a smile that Judas in hell might be proud of. When I was in my room and about to lie down, I thought I heard a whispering at my door. I went to it softly and listened. Unless my ears deceived me, I heard the voice of the Count. Back, back to your own place. Your time is not yet come. Wait, have patience. Tonight is mine. Tomorrow night is yours. There was a low, sweet ripple of laughter, and in a rage, I threw open the door and saw without the three terrible women licking their lips. As I appeared, they all joined in a horrible laugh and ran away. I came back to my room and threw myself on my knees. Is it then so near the end? Tomorrow, tomorrow, Lord help me and those to whom I am dear. 30 June, morning. These may be the last words I ever write in this diary. I slept till just before the dawn, and when I woke, threw myself on my knees, for I determined that if death came, he should find me ready. At last I felt the subtle change in the air and knew that the morning had come. Then came the welcome cock crow, and I felt that I was safe. With a glad heart, I opened the door and ran down to the hall. I had seen that the door was unlocked, and now escape was before me. With hands that trembled with eagerness, I unhooked the chains and drew back the massive bolts. But the door would not move. Despair seized me. I pulled and pulled at the door and shook it till, massive as it was, it rattled in its casement. I could see the bolt shot. It had been locked after I left the count. Then a wild desire took me to obtain the key at any risk, and I determined then and there to scale the wall again and gain the Count's room. He might kill me, but death now seemed the happier choice of evils. Without a pause, I rushed up to the east window and scrambled down the wall, as before, into the Count's room. It was empty, but that was as I expected. I could not see a key anywhere, but the heap of gold remained. I went through the door in the corner and down the winding stair and along the dark passage to the old chapel. I knew now well enough where to find the monster I sought. The great box was in the same place, close against the wall, but the lid was laid on it, not fastened down, but with the nails ready in their places to be hammered home. I knew I must reach the body for the key, so I raised the lid and laid it back against the wall. And then I saw something which filled my very soul with horror. There lay the Count, but looking as if his youth had been half renewed, for the white hair and moustache were changed to dark iron gray. The cheeks were fuller, and the white skin seemed ruby red underneath. The mouth was redder than ever, for on the lips were gouts of fresh blood, which trickled from the corners of the mouth and ran over the chin and neck. Even the deep burning eyes seemed set amongst swollen flesh, for the lids and pouches underneath were bloated. It seemed as if the whole awful creature were simply gorged with blood. He lay like a filthy leech, 
exhausted with his repletion. I shuddered as I bent over to touch him, and every sense in me revolted at the contact. But I had to search, or I was lost. The coming night might see my own body a banquet in a similar way to those horrid three. I felt all over the body, but no sign could I find of the key. Then I stopped and looked at the count. There was a mocking smile on the bloated face which seemed to drive me mad. This was the being I was helping to transfer to London, where perhaps for centuries to come he might, amongst its teeming millions, satiate his lust for blood and create a new and ever-widening circle of semi-demons to batten on the helpless. The very thought drove me mad. A terrible desire came upon me to rid the world of such a monster. There was no lethal weapon at hand, but I seized a shovel which the workman had been using to fill the cases, and lifting it high, struck with the edge downward at the hateful face. But as I did so, the head turned, and the eyes fell upon me with all their blaze of basilisk horror. The sight seemed to paralyze me, and the shovel turned in my hand and glanced from the face, merely making a deep gash above the forehead. The shovel fell from my hand across the box, and as I pulled it away, the flange of the blade caught the edge of the lid, which fell over again and hid the horrid thing from my sight. The last glimpse I had, excuse me, the last glimpse I had was of the bloated face, blood-stained and fixed with a grin of malice which would have held its own in the nethermost hell. I thought and thought what should be my next move, but my brain seemed on fire, and I waited with a despairing feeling growing over me. As I waited, I heard in the distance a gypsy song sung by merry voices coming closer, and through their song the rolling of heavy wheels and the cracking of whips. The Zegany and the Slovaks, of whom the Count had spoken, were coming. With a last look around and at the box which contained the vile body, I ran from the place and gained the Count's room, determined to rush out at the moment the door should open. Excuse me. Determined to rush out at the moment the door should be opened. With strained ears, I listened and heard downstairs the grinding of the key in the great lock and the falling back of the heavy door. There must have been some other means of entry, or someone had a key for one of the locked doors. Then there came the sound of many feet tramping and dying away in some passage, which sent up a clanging echo. I turned to run down again towards the vault, where I might find the new entrance. But at the moment there seemed to come a violent puff of wind, and the door to the winding stair blew to with a shock that set the dust from the lintels flying. When I ran to push it open, I found that it was hopelessly fast. I was again a prisoner, and the net of doom was closing round me more closely. As I write, there is in the passage below a sound of many tramping feet, and the crash of weights being set down heavily, doubtless the boxes with their freight of earth. There is a sound of hammering, it is the box being nailed down. Now I can hear the heavy feet tramping, along, tramping again along the hall, with many other idle feet coming behind them. The door is shut. The chains rattle. There is a grinding of the key in the lock. I can hear the key withdrawn. Then another door opens and shuts. I hear the creaking of lock and bolt. Hark! In the courtyard and down the rocky way, the roll of heavy wheels, the crack of whips, and the chorus of the zegony as they pass into the distance. I am alone in the castle with those awful women. Bow! Oh. Mina is a woman, and there is naught in common. They are devils of the pit. I shall not remain alone with them. I shall try to scale the castle wall farther than I have yet attempted. I shall take some of the gold with me, lest I want it later. I may find a way from this dreadful place. And then, away for home, away to the quickest and nearest train, away from the cursed spot, from this cursed land, where the devil and his children still walk with earthly feet. At least God's mercy is better than that of these monsters, and the precipice is steep and high. At its foot, a man may sleep as a man. Goodbye, all. Mina. And that concludes Jonathan Harker's journal entry 
tomorrow we hear from new voices and we'll see if we learn uh, whether Jonathan Harker, or I wonder at which point we'll learn if Jonathan Harker's attempt to escape from Castle Dracula was successful or not. We'll find out eventually. Um, I actually haven't read beyond where we're at now, so I really don't know um, if he's going to make it out alive or not. Um, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see what happens next. So thank you very much for joining me today. Um, I look forward to joining you tomorrow for more of Dracula by Bram Stoker. Thank you very much. Bye. Hey friends, I can't tell if this is going live or not. I'm going to assume it is. This is not my best technical day. However, I think we just went live. Okay, so hi, I'm Christina, the manager at the Pacific Beach Library. We are reading day five of Dracula. And of course, this is a very spooky story about crazy and un supernatural kind of things, which could perhaps explain why. Could the vampires have something to do with why I had my phone short out on me twice today and we had to go to a whole nother different kind of technology? Hmm. Perhaps. Let's blame the vampires. So, um, again, if you were with me for the earlier two attempts, I do apologize. I don't know what's going on. Um, again, we'll try to fix it and get it better by next week. But in the meantime, we'll continue with our story. And thank you again for bearing with me. So, to recap, for those who have, in, in case you haven't already seen this twice, I apologize if you have. Hi, I'm Christina. We're about to read Chapter 5 of Dracula. Today I'm drinking a Darjeeling tea. It came from the Shakespeare Tea Shop on India Street. It's lovely. Okay. And I do want to sip because it really is lovely. Yummy. I hope that we don't lose our connection yet again, but if we do, eh, it's not a terrible thing, I guess. I get to have a nice sip of tea each time to start out. So, one more time. Today, we are going to read Chapter 5, but before that, let's discuss a little bit about Chapter 4. Chapter 4 covers about a month and a half of action. It is Jonathan Harker's journal entries written in shorthand, which doesn't sound like a new thing to us because shorthand is not a very commonly used type of script nowadays, but at the time that this book was published in 1897, shorthand was a relatively new invention. And so the idea is that Jonathan Harker is able to write these notes about what's happening in Castle Dracula, and you can pretty safely assume that Count Dracula, even if you were to go through his things, is not going to be able to read it. And so that's why he can be pretty, pretty forthright in his journals about what's there. Um, by the way, I saw a note from Adrienne that I that shows my phone is okay. I do too, although if it's not, maybe it's an excuse to buy a new phone. It's, it's not a terrible thing. Um, <laughs> let's see. Um, okay, so chapter four starts out with Jonathan Harker waking up alone in his bed. The Count of Drac the Count Dracula has brought him up to his bedroom and undressed him. Again, these are kind of the. Um, uh, there's some interesting elements to the book too. Um, it's interesting, I was actually just doing a video about this book um, for Banned Book Week, and because, you know, we're, next week is the week where libraries celebrate everyone's freedom to read and make their own decisions about what books are good books, what books are not books that they agree with, or, you know, that they find to be of literary merit, or, you know, that to inform their own opinions, their learned opinions, based on being able to have the opportunity to read something for themselves and make up their own minds. And so um, Dracula, it's really interesting. Dr even though Dracula was published in 1897, there was actually a challenge made against the book in 1994. So 97 years after publication, um, the book was taken off of a reading list for schools in Texas. And part of it was because some of the this mm, sort of sexual imagery. And I think that in, in chapter three is where we get some of that, especially too, with those women who are with Jonathan Harker. And then again, here too, where um, the, you know, the Count is undressing him. So we, it doesn't say that anything too untoward is happening, you know, other than blood sucking perhaps. But you know, there's, that perhaps could be some of the controversy around Dracula. Um, which again, I kind of think pales next to the whole blood sucking thing. But you know, to each their own, everyone makes their own decisions about books. And that is the freedom to read. Um, let's see, so in this chapter, chapter four, he starts out and he acknowledges at the end of the first journal entry that even though he's been afraid to be in the room where he is staying at Castle Dracula, he now feels it to be so much safer and indeed a sanctuary compared to where he was with the three mysterious women who he describes as waiting to suck my blood. So he now is convinced that these women, um, who again, he might have at first viewed in a sexual light are now a menace to his safety. Um, as the chapter goes on, there's some bits about how um, the Count 
had had um, Jonathan Harker write some letters that were post dated. Um, we later see that the Count leaves Castle Dracula dressed up in the clothing that Jonathan Harker originally wore when he arrived and that he delivers the letters in that clothing. And the idea that Jonathan Harker has is that the Count is trying to make it look that Jonathan Harker is still out and about, that he is that he is himself delivering his own letters. And then also, if Count Dracula is abducting more children or killing people or whatever it was, that, you know, whatever evil he is doing in the towns, by wearing the clothing of Jonathan Harker, he might be passing suspicion onto Jonathan instead of onto himself. And so um, that is happening in the chapter. Also, too, um, there's a bit in there where some workmen deliver boxes, some crates to the castle. And it doesn't directly say what it is they're doing. They seem to be doing something with dirt. They're, they're shoveling things. Um, then later on, um, he there are some um, Sekali, I think is what Sekali, I think they were called. Um, the, the gypsies, they come by and Jonathan Harker tries to bribe them to take one of his letters but the they actually end up turning the the letters back over to the count so the count knows now that jonathan harker was trying to communicate with the outside world is not pleased um yeah sorry there were 50 boxes oh sorry eventually jonathan harker decides he you know he cannot stand being a prisoner in this way anymore and he decides to investigate because so many of the doors in the castle are locked he decides the best way to investigate to to get into the count's room um, because in the daylight the count never comes out so he assumes he's in his room resting jonathan harker decides that he too will climb like a lizard along the outside walls of the castle so he climbs outside from his room up 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 to the room of count dracula and he goes inside he goes down 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 some steps and eventually he finds yeah the 50 50 boxes filled with earth um filled with sand or dirt and in one of them there is um, the count. The count Dracula is lying, and he seems to be not dead, but not quite fully alive, and it's in a weird state. Um, eventually, eventually in the chapter, Count Dracula says he will be leaving soon, and he will arrange for passage for Jonathan Harker on the following day. But Jonathan Harker is concerned that it's not true because when he listens outside of his door, he thinks he hears. Count Dracula telling the women that tonight is mine, but tomorrow night is yours. And basically that he could, that they can have Jonathan Harker after the Count leaves. And so Jonathan Harker, when he wakes up on the morning of the 30th, he's petrified. He's convinced that this is his last day. Um, and what he does is he gets back. He, he tries to, um, excuse me. He, go, he climbs again to the room of Count Dracula, and when he goes there, he tries to kill him, but then the Count seems to somehow stop him, to compel him not to, and he is frightened and he runs away. When he runs away, the door locks behind, and he is unable to get back down to the Count. Then the, the workmen come, they take away the boxes, they take away the box, including the one that contained Count Dracula, and he is locked, and he's left alone, and he is afraid of being alone with those women and he's thinking there has to be some way i think i can get out of here i'm going to try one more time i'm going to take some of the gold that i found in count dracula's room and i'm going to do my best to escape and to to die in the attempt would be better than to stay here and so where his journal entry ends we don't know what's going to happen next because jonathan harker is going to do his best to escape all right now we get to start chapter five thank you again for bearing with me for all of our through all of our technical difficulties today Today is chapter five. It is entitled Letter from Miss Mina Murray to Miss Lucy West Westenra. Um, and again, the where we left off in the narrative was on June the 30th. This is going to be from another from the perspective of some other characters. And as I did before, I'll go ahead and draw a line um, with my hand to separate the different entries within this chapter. Okay, so I'll start out with chapter five. Nine May, my dearest Lucy. Forgive my long delay in writing, but I have been simply overwhelmed with work. The life of an assistant schoolmistress is sometimes trying. I am longing to be with you and by the sea, where we can talk together freely and build our castles in the air. I have been working very hard lately because I want to keep up with Jonathan's studies, and I have been practicing shorthand very assiduously. 
When we are married, I shall be able to be useful to Jonathan. And if I can stenograph well enough, I can take down what he wants to say in this way and write it out for him on the typewriter, at which also I am practicing very hard. He and I sometimes write letters in shorthand, and he is keeping a stenographic journal of his travels abroad. When I am with you, I shall keep a diary in the same way. I don't mean one of those two pages to the week with Sunday squeezed in a corner diaries, but a sort of journal which I can write in whenever I feel inclined. I do not suppose there will be much of interest to other people, but it is not intended for them. I may show it to Jonathan some day if there is in it anything worth sharing, but it is really an exercise book. I shall try to do what I see lady journalists do, interviewing and writing descriptions and trying to remember conversations. I am told that, with a little practice, one can remember all that goes on or that one hears said during a day. However, we shall see. I will tell you of my little plans when we meet. I have just had a few hurried lines from Jonathan from Transylvania. He is well and will be returning in about a week. I am longing to hear all his news. It must be so nice to see strange countries. I wonder if we, I mean Jonathan and I, shall ever see them together. There is the 10 o'clock bell ringing. Goodbye, your loving Mina. Tell me all the news when you write. You have not told me anything for a long time. I hear rumors, and especially of a tall, handsome, curly-haired man. And there's three question marks. Letter, Lucy West Fenra to Mina Murray, 17 Chatham Street, Wednesday. My dearest Mina, I must say you tax me very unfairly with being a bad correspondent. I wrote you twice since we parted, and your last letter was only your second. Besides, I have nothing to tell you. There is really nothing to interest you. Town is very pleasant just now, and we go on a great deal to picture galleries and for walks and rides in the park. As to the tall, curly-haired man, I suppose it was the one who was with me at the last pop. Someone has evidently been, ta been telling tales. That was Mr. Holmwood. He often comes to see us, and he and Mama get on very well together. They have so many things to talk about in common. We met some time ago a man that would just do for you, if you were not already engaged to Jonathan. He is an excellent parti, being handsome, well off, and of good birth. He is a doctor and really clever. Just fancy. He is only nine and twenty, and he, he has an immense lunatic asylum all under his own care. Mr. Holmwood introduced him to me, and he called here to see us, and often comes now. I think he is one of the most resolute men I ever saw, and yet the most calm. He seems absolutely imperturbable. I can fancy what a wonderful power he must have over his patients. He has a curious habit of looking one straight in the face, as if trying to read one's thoughts. He tries this on very much with me, but I flatter myself that he has got a tough nut to crack. I know that from my glass. Do you ever try to read your own face? I do, and I can tell you it is not a bad study and gives you more trouble than you can well fancy if you have never tried it. He says that I afford him a curious psychological study, and I humbly think I do. I do not, as you know, take sufficient interest in dress to be able to describe the new fashions. Dress is a bore. That is slang again, but never mind. Arthur says that every day. There, it is all out. Mina, we have told all our secrets to each other since we were children. We have slept together and eaten together and laughed and cried together. And now, though I have spoken, I would like to speak more. Oh, Mina, couldn't you guess? I love him. I am blushing as I write, for although I think he loves me, he has not told me so in words. But, oh, Mina, I love him. I love him. There, that does me good. I wish I were with you, dear, sitting by the fire undressing, as we used to sit, and I would try to tell you what I feel. I do not know how I am writing this even to you. I am afraid to stop, or I should tear up the letter, and I don't want to stop. For I do so want to tell you all. Let me hear from you at once and tell me all that you think about it. Mina, I must stop. Good night. Bless me in your prayers. And Mina, pray for my happiness. Lucy. P.S. I need not tell you this is a secret. Good night again. L. Letter. Lucy Westenra to Mina Murray. 
24 May. My dearest Mina, thanks and thanks and thanks again for your sweet letter. It was so nice to be able to tell you and to have your sympathy. My dear, it never pours, but it rains. How true the old proverbs are. Here I am, who shall be 20 in September, and yet I never had a proposal till today. Not a real proposal. And today, I have had three. Just fancy. Three proposals in one day. Isn't it awful? I feel sorry, really and truly sorry, for two of the poor fellows. Oh, Mina, I am so happy that I don't know what to do with myself. And three proposals! But for goodness sake, don't tell any of the girls or they would be getting all sorts of extravagant ideas and imagining themselves injured and slightest if in their very first day at home they did not get six at least. Some girls are so vain. You and I, Mina dear, who are engaged and are going to settle down soon soberly into old married women, can despise vanity. Well, I must tell you about the three, but you must keep it a secret, dear, from everyone. Except, of course, Jonathan. You will tell him, because I would, if I were in your place, certainly tell Arthur. A woman ought to tell her husband everything, don't you think so, dear? And I must be fair. Men like women, certainly their wives, to be quite as fair as they are. And women, I am afraid, are not always quite as fair as they should be. Well, my dear, number one came just before lunch. I told you of him, Dr. John Seward, the lunatic asylum man with the strong jaw and the good forehead. He was very cool outwardly, but was nervous all the same. He had evidently been schooling himself as to all sorts of little things and remembered them but he almost managed to sit down on his silk hat, which men don't generally do when they are cool. And then when he wanted to appear at ease, he kept playing with the lancet in a way that made me nearly scream. He spoke to me, Mina, very straightforwardly. He told me how dear I was to him, though he had known me so little, and what his life would be with me to help and cheer him. He was going to tell me how unhappy he would be if I did not care for him, but when he saw me cry, he said he was a brute and would not add to my present trouble. Then he broke off and asked if I could love him in time. And when I shook my head, his hands trembled. And then with some hesitation, he asked me if I cared already for anyone else. He put it very nicely, saying that he did not want to wring my confidence from me, but only to know, because if a woman's heart was free, a man might have hope. And then, Mina, I felt a sort of duty to tell him that there was someone. I told him that, I only told him that much, and then he stood up, and he looked very strong and very grave as he took both my hands in his, and said he hoped I would be happy, and that if I ever wanted a friend, I must count him one of my best. Oh, Mina, dear, I can't help crying, and you must excuse this letter being all blotted. Being proposed to is all very nice, and all that sort of thing, but it isn't at all a happy thing when you have to see a poor fellow, whom you know loves you honestly, going away and looking all broken-hearted. And to know that, no matter what he may say at the moment, you are passing quite out of his life. My dear, I must stop here at present. I feel so miserable, though I am so happy. Evening. Arthur has just gone, and I feel in better spirits than when I left off so I can go on telling you about the day. Well, my dear, number two came after lunch. He was such a nice fellow, an American from Texas, and he looks so young and fresh that it seems almost impossible that he has been to so many places as that and has had many, and has had such adventures. I sympathize with poor Desdemona when she had such a dangerous stream poured in her ear, even by a black man. I suppose that we women are such cowards that we think a man will save us from fears, and we marry him. I know now what I would do if I were a man and wanted to make a girl love me. No, I don't, for there was Mr. Morris telling us his stories, and Arthur never told any, and yet, my dear, I am somewhat previous. Mr. Quincy P. Morris found me alone. It seems that a man always does find a girl alone. No, he doesn't, for Arthur tried twice to make a chance, and I helping him was all and I helping him all I could. I am not ashamed to say it now. I must tell you beforehand that Mr. Morris doesn't always speak slang. That is to say, 
He never does so to strangers or before them, for he is really well educated and has exquisite manners. But he found out that amused but he found out that it amused me to hear him talk American slang, and whenever I was present and there was no one to be shocked, he said such funny things. I am afraid, my dear, he has to invent it all, for it fits exactly into whatever else he has to say. But this is a way slang has. I do not know myself if I shall ever speak slang. I do not know if Arthur likes it, as I have never heard him use any as yet. Well, Mr. Morris sat down beside me and looked as happy and jolly as he could, but I could see all the same that he was very nervous. He took my hand in his and said ever so sweetly, Miss Lucy, I know I ain't good enough to regulate the fixings of your little shoes, but I guess if you wait till you find a man that is, you will go join them seven young women with the lamps when you quit. Won't you just hitch up alongside of me and let us go down the long road together, driving in double harness? Well, he did look so good-humored and so jolly that it didn't seem half so hard to refuse him as it did poor Dr. Seward. So I said, as lightly as I could, that I did not know anything of hitching and that I wasn't broken to harness at all yet. Then he said that he had spoken in a light manner and he hoped that if he had made a mistake in doing so on, in doing so, on so grave a momentous an occasion for him, I would forgive him. He really did look serious when he was saying it, and I couldn't help feeling a bit serious, too. I know, Mina, you will think me a horrid flirt, though I couldn't help feeling a sort of exultation that he was a number two in the day. And then, my dear, before I could say a word, he began pouring out a perfect torrent of love-making, laying his very heart and soul at my feet. He looked so earnest over it that I shall never again think that a man must be playful always and never earnest because he is merry at times. I suppose he saw something in my face which checked him, for he suddenly stopped, and said with the sort of manly fervor that I could have loved him for if I had been free, Lucy, you are an honest-hearted girl, I know. I should not be here speaking to you as I am now if I did not believe you clean grit, right through to the very depths of your soul. Tell me, like one good fellow to another, is there anyone else that you care for? And if there is, I'll never trouble you a hair's breadth again, but will be, if you will let me, a very faithful friend. My dear Mina, why are men so noble when we women are so little worthy of them? Here was I almost making fun of this great-hearted, true gentleman. I burst into tears. I am afraid, my dear, you will think this a very sloppy letter in more ways than one, and I really felt very badly. Why can't they let a girl marry three men, or as many as want her, and save all this trouble? But this is heresy, and I must not say it. I am glad to say that, though I was crying, I was able to look into Mr. Morris's brave eyes, and I told him out straight, Yes, there is someone I love, though he has not told me yet that he loves me. I was right to speak to him so frankly, for quite a light went into his excuse me, for quite a light came into his face, and he put out both his hands and took mine. I think I put them into his, and said in a hearty way, That's my brave girl. It's better worth being late for a chance of winning you than being in time for any other girl in the world. Don't cry, my dear. If it's for me, I'm a hard nut to crack, and I take it standing up. If that other fellow doesn't know his happiness, well, he better look for it soon or he'll have to deal with me. Little girl, your honesty and pluck have made me a friend, and that's rarer than a lover. It's more unselfish, anyhow. My dear, I'm going to have a pretty lonely walk between this and kingdom come. Won't you give me one kiss? It'll be something to keep off the darkness now and then. You can, you know, if you like. For that other good fellow, he must be a good fellow, my dear, and a fine fellow where you could not love him. He hasn't spoken yet. That quite won me, Mina, for it was brave and sweet of him, and noble too, to a rival, wasn't it? And he so sad, so I leant over and kissed him. He stood up with my two hands in his, and as he looked down into my face, I'm afraid I was blushing very much, he said, Little girl, I hold your hand, and you've kissed me, and if those these things don't make us friends, nothing ever will. Thank you for your sweet honesty to me, and goodbye. He wrung my hand, and taking up his hat, went straight out of the room without looking back, without a tear or a quiver or a pause. And I am crying like a baby. Oh, 
Why must a man like that be made unhappy when there are gr when there are lots of girls about who would worship the very ground he trod on? I know I would if I were free. Only, I don't want to be free. My dear, this quite upset me, and I feel I cannot write of happiness just at once after telling you of it. And I don't wish to tell you of the number three until it can be all happy. Ever your loving, Lucy. P.S. Oh, about number three? I needn't tell you of number three, need I? Besides, it was all so confused. It seemed only a moment from his coming into the room till both his arms were round me and he was kissing me. I am very, very happy, and I don't know what I have done to deserve it. I must only try in the future to show that I am not ungrateful to God for all his goodness to me in sending to me such a lover, such a husband, and such a friend. Goodbye. Dr. Seward's Diary Kept in phonograph. 25 May. <clears throat> ebb tight, excuse me, ebb tide in appetite today. Cannot eat, cannot rest, so diary instead. Since my rebuff of yesterday, I have a sort of empty feeling. Nothing in the world seems of sufficient importance to be worth the doing. As I knew that the only cure for this sort of thing was work, I went amongst the patients. I picked out one who's afforded me a study of much interest. He is so quaint that I am determined to understand him as well as I can. Today I seem to get nearer than ever before to the heart of his mystery. I questioned him more fully than I have ever done, with a view to making myself master of the facts of his hallucination. In my manner of doing it there was, I now see, something of cruelty. I seem to wish to keep him to the point of madness, a thing which I avoid with the patience as I would the mouth of hell. Memo. Under what circumstances would I not avoid the pit of hell? Omnia Romae Venalia Sunt. Hell has its price. Verb Sap. If there be anything behind this instinct, it will be valuable to trace it afterwards accurately, so I had better commence to do so. Therefore, R. M. Renfield, Etat 59. Sanguine temperament. Great physical strength morbidly excitable, periods of gloom, ending in some fixed idea which I cannot make out. I presume that the sanguine temperament itself and the disturbing influence end in a mentally accomplished finish. A possibly dangerous man, possibly dangerous if unselfish. In selfish men, caution is as secure an armor for their foes as for themselves. What I think of on this point is, when fixed, is the... What I think of on this point is, when self is the fixed point, the centripetal force is balanced with a centrifugal. When duty, a cause, etc., is the fixed point, the latter force is paramount, and only accident or a series of accidents can balance it. Letter, Quincy P. Morris to Honorable Arthur Holmwood, 25 May. My dear Art, We've told yarns by the campfire in the prairies, and dressed one another's wounds after trying a landing at the Marquesas, and drunk health on the shore of Titicaca. There are more yarns to be told, and other wounds to be healed, and another health to be drunk. Won't you let this be at my campfire tomorrow night? I have no hesitation in asking you, as I know a certain lady is engaged to a certain dinner party, and that you are free. There will only be one other, our old pal at the Korea, Jack Seward. He's coming too, and we both want to mingle our weeps over the wine cup and to drink a health with all our hearts to the happiest man in all the wide world who has won the noblest heart that God has made and best worth winning. We promise you a hearty welcome and a loving greeting and a health as true as your own right hand. We both we shall both swear to, to leave you at home if you drink too deep to a certain pair of eyes. Come. Yours as ever and always, Quincy P. Morris. Telegraph, excuse me, telegram from Arthur Holmwood to Quincy P. Morris. 26 May. Count me in every time. I bear messages which will make both your ears tingle. Art. And that concludes chapter five, our first week. So we're learning a bit about Nina, the fiance of Jonathan Harker, and her good friend Lucy. And apparently the three men that all proposed to Lucy in the same day all know each other and are about to go out to go out for drinks. So we'll see what happens in the next chapter. Thank you for joining me for this first week of our read-along together of Dracula. 
by Bram Stoker, and I'll see you next time. Thank you very much. Ah. Bye. Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Christina, the manager of the Pacific Beach Library. Thank you for joining me for week two and day six of our read along together of Dracula by Bram Stoker. Um, let's see. I thought we would celebrate not only that we are enjoying our new book together, but also I have a personal milestone. I am celebrating today 21 years of happy employment uh, with the city of San Diego as a librarian. And so because if 21 years of employment was like 21 years of life, which it is, right? It means that I should legally be able to drink on the job. Tea, to drink tea on the job. So I celebrated by buying myself a brand new teapot. Isn't it pretty? Um, I got it, at, for anyone who is local and is interested in teapots, I got it at the Marukai Market. They had a lovely assortment. And today's tea is a fresh chamomile, or by fresh I mean um, chamomile blo dried chamomile blossoms. I made some chamomile ice cream this weekend. It came out okay. I think I can do better by changing the recipe. Thank you for the congratulations. I appreciate it. Um, and so I made, I bought the chamomile, the dried chamomile at the market so I could use it for the ice cream. And then I was like, well, I'm going to have it in my tea also. And so it's just a lovely little celebratory tea. Mm. Delicious as it should be. But yeah, I, I do enjoy the clear teapot and everything just because I think it's, especially when I'm doing something loose leaf, I, I used to be worried in the beginning that did I put enough tea? Did I put too much tea? Is it going to be, is it going to get the proper amount of steeping? And so I do like the clear ones because then I can actually see the color of it. And plus two, the tea is just so beautiful. Most of my teacups at home are, um, they're an opaque kind of thing. Like, you know, they're ceramic or something like that. And so I don't, I can see the color from the top, but I can't get to see the color shining through it. And so I do actually like having this clear set to read together, when I read together with you to be able to enjoy it that way also. So thank you very much for everybody for joining me today. It is, it's funny, 20 something years in, I finally came up with this thing of doing the read alouds together and I love it. I started out as a children's librarian and I love doing the story times with the kids. And so thank you for giving me this opportunity to do story times with grown-ups. also. I really enjoy it. <laughs> so um, let's talk a little bit about what we read together on Friday, and then we'll get into today's reading. Friday was a short chapter. We um, had ended the previous day on Thursday with chapter four, where we had read four days of Jonathan Harker's journal. And it had actually ended on June 30th. On Friday, though, we got a total change of pace. We switched over to different voices. We, st we switched over to a letter from Miss Mina Murray to her good friend, Miss Lucy Westenra. Mina, we'd heard previously referred to as the fiance of Jonathan Harker. And the first letter in that chapter from Mina to Lucy was dated May the 9th. So almost two months prior to the conclusion of prior to the action um, depicted at the conclusion of chapter four. Um, and so when Jonathan had just gone to Transylvania and we, she didn't really know much about what was going on there. What we discover is that Lu uh, Mina has written her good friend, Lucy, and she's asking like, what's going on? I heard there's some suitor. And then Lucy writes back and she basically says, you know, actually I have three suitors right now. And she tells Mina about the three of them. And interestingly enough, all three of them propose to Lucy and she, um, the three, the three men are Dr. Seward, who is, who runs a lunatic asylum located next door, um, to where, um, I believe where Count Dracula is about to have his house. Um, he talks, by the way, too, about one of his patients, a Mr. Renfield, who is an interesting, interesting man. And, um, she also talks about a gentleman named Quincy Morris, who is an American and who, if, it's, if I can keep it up and remember, he's going to be kind of a cowboy accent kind of thing in my read aloud, just because I find him amusing that way. I love this. I'm sorry, I skipped ahead and I see a line about, we've told yarns by the campfire in the prairies. Total cowboy. And so um, he's he's one of the gentlemen who, who proposed to Lucy, but she declined him because her heart was engaged elsewhere. And the implication is that the gentleman whom she is in love with is a man named Arthur Holmwood, um, who is also a friend of Mr. Se Dr. Seward and Quincy Morris. And so the chapter five ended with um, Quincy inviting Arthur to dinner with their good friend, um, Jack Seward, and they're going to talk with each other and share messages that will make both your ears tingle. And so now let's go ahead and read chapter six and see if it makes our ears tingle. All right, let's go in and read chapter six together. It is entitled Mina Murray's Journal. 24 July, 
Whitby. Lucy met me at the station, looking sweeter and lovelier than ever, and we drove up to the house at the Crescent in which they have rooms. This is a lovely place. The little river, the Esk, runs through a deep valley which broadens out as it comes near the harbor. A great viaduct runs across with high piers, through which the view seems somehow further away than it really is. The valley is beautifully green, and it is so steep that when you're on the high land on either side, you look right across it until you are near enough to see down. The houses of the old town, the side away from us, are all red roofed and seem piled up one over the other anyhow, like the pictures we see of Nuremberg. Right over the town is the ruin of Whitby Abbey, which was sacked by the Danes, and which is the scent, excuse me, and which is the scene of part of Marmion where the girl was built up in the wall. It is a most noble ruin of immense size and full of beautiful and romantic bits. There is a legend that a white lady is seen in one of the windows. Between it and the town, there is another church, the parish one, round which is a big graveyard, all full of tombstones. This is to my mind, the nicest spot in Whitby, for it lies right over the town and has a full view of the harbor and all of the bay to where the headland called Kettleness stretches out into the sea. It descends so steeply over the harbor that part of the bank has fallen away and some of the graves have been destroyed. In one place, part of the stonework of the graves stretches out over the sandy pathway far below. There are walks with seats beside them through the churchyard and people go and sit there all day long, looking at the beautiful view and enjoying the breeze. I shall come and sit here very often myself and work. Indeed, I am writing now with my book on my knee and listening to the talk of three old men who are sitting beside me. They seem to do nothing all day, but sit up here and talk. The harbor lies below me, with, on the far side, one long granite wall stretching out into the sea, with a curve outwards at the end of it, in the middle of which is a lighthouse. A heavy sea wall runs along outside of it. On the near side, the sea wall makes an elbow crooked inversely, and its end too has a lighthouse. Between the, pier, between the two piers, there is a narrow opening into the harbor, which then suddenly widens. It is nice at high water, but when the tide is out, it shoals away to nothing, and there is merely the stream of the S running out between, excuse me, running between banks of sand with rocks here and there. Outside the harbor on this side, there rises for about half a mile a great reef, the sharp edge of which runs straight out from behind the south lighthouse. At the end of it is a buoy with a bell, which swings in bad weather and sends in a mournful sound on the wind. They have a legend here that when a ship is lost, bells are heard out at sea. I must ask the old man about this. He is coming this way. He is a funny old man. He must be awfully old, for his face is all gnarled and twisted like the bark of a tree. He tells me that he is nearly a hundred, and that he was a sailor in the Greenland fishing fleet when Waterloo was fought. He is, I am afraid, a very skeptical person, for when I asked him about the bells at sea and the white lady at the abbey, he said very brusquely, I won't fash myself about them, miss. Them things be all worn out. Mind, I don't say that they never was, but I do say that they wasn't in my time. They be all very well for comers and trippers and the like, but not for a nice young lady like you. Them feet folks from York and Leeds that be always eating cured herons and drinking tea and looking out to buy cheap jet would creed aught. I wonder myself who'd be bothering telling lies to them, even the newspapers, which is full, full of fool talk. I thought he would be a good person to, le to learn interesting things from, so I asked him if he would mind telling me something about the whale fishing in the old days. He was just settling himself to begin when the clock struck six, whereupon he labored to get up and said, I must gang againwards home now, miss. My granddaughter won't like to be kept waiting when the tea is ready, for it takes me time to crammle a bound degrees, for there be a many of em. And miss, I lack belly timber, sarely be the sarely by the clock. He hobbled away, and I could see him hurrying as well as he could down the steps. The steps are a great feature on the place. They lead from the town to the church. There are hundreds of them, I do not know how many, and they wind up in a delicate curve. The slope is so gentle that a horse could easily walk up and down them. 
I think they must originally have had something to do with the Abbey. I shall go home too. Lucy went out, visiting with her mother, and as they were only duty calls, I did not go. They will be home by this. 1st August. I came up here an hour ago with Lucy, and we had a most interesting talk with my old friend and the two others who always come and join him. He is evidently the Sir Oracle of them, and I should think must have been in his time a most dictatorial person. He will not admit anything and down faces everybody. If he can't out-argue them, he bullies them and then takes their silence for agreement with his views. Lucy was looking sweetly pretty in her white lawn frock. She has got a beautiful color since she has been here. I noticed that the old men did not lose any time in coming up and sitting near her when we sat down. She is so sweet with old people. I think they all fell in love with her on the spot. Even my old man succumbed and did not contradict her, but gave me double share instead. <laughs> I got him on the subject of the legends, and he went off at once into a sort of sermon. I must try to remember it and put it all down. It be all fool talk, lock, stock, and barrel. That's what it be, and no else. These bands and wafts and bog ghosts and bar guests and bogles, and all lament them is only fit to set barons and dizzy women a belder in. They be nought but air blebs. They and all grims and sights and warnings be all invented by parsons and illsome book bodies, book bodies, and railway touters to skeer and scunner halflings, and to get folks to do something that they don't other incline to do. It makes me ireful to think of them. Why, it's them that, not content with printing lies on paper and preaching them out of pulpits, does want to be cutting them on the tombstones. Look here all around you and what ert you will. All them stains holding up their heads as well they can out of their pride is a cant. Simply tumbling down with the weight of the lies wrote on them. Here lies the body, or sacred to the memory wrote on all of them. And yet in nigh half of them there bain't no bodies at all. And the memories of them bain't cure, cared a pinch of snuff about, much less sacred. Lies, all of them, nothing but lies of one kind or another. My gog, it, but it'll be a, be a queer wonderment of the day of judgment when they come tumbling up in their death sarks, all drooped together and trying to drag their tombstones with them to prove how good they was. Some of them trimlin' and ditherin' with their hands that dozened and slippin' from lying in the sea that they can't even keep their grip of them. I could see from the old fellow's self-satisfied air and the way in which he looked round for the approval of his cronies that he was showing off. So I put in a word to keep him going. Oh, Mr. Swales, you can't be serious. Surely these tombstones are not all wrong. Yablins, there may be a poorish few not wrong, savin' where they make out the people too good. For there be folk that do think a balm bowl be like the sea, if only it be their own. The whole thing be only lies. Now look ye here. You come here a stranger, and you see this Kirk Garth. I nodded, for I thought it better to assent, though I did not quite understand his dialect. I knew it had something to do with the church. He went on, and you consate that all these stains be a boon folk that be happened here. Snod and snog. I assented again. Then that be just where the lie comes in. Why, there be scores of these lay beds that be told that be tomb as old Dunn's back a box on Friday night. He judged, he nudged one of his companions and they all laughed. And my gog, how could they be otherwise? Look at that one. The aftest abate, the aftest abaft the beer bank. Read it. I went over and read Edward Spence Law, Master Mariner, murdered by pirates off the coast of Andres. April 1854, at 30. When I came back, Mr. Swales went on. Who brought him home, I wonder, to have him here? Murdered off the coast of Andres, and you conceded his body lay under? Why, I could name ye a dozen whose bones lie in the Greenland seas above, he pointed northwards, or where the currents may have drifted them. There be the stains around ye. Ye can, with your young eyes, read the small print of the lies from here. This Braithwaite Lowry, I knew his father, 
Lost in the Lively off Greenland in 20, or Andrew Woodhouse, Drowned in the Same Seas in 1777, or John Paxton, Drowned off Cape Farewell a year later, or old John Rawlings, whose grandfather sailed with me, Drowned in the Gulf of Finland in 50. Do you think that all these men will have to make a rush to Whitby when the trumpet sounds? I have me anthrums about it. I tell ye that when they got here, they'd be jomlin and jostlin one another that way, that it'd be like a fight up on the ice in the old days, when we'd be at one another from daylight to dark, and trying to tie up our cuts by the light of the aurora borealis. This was evidently local pleasantry, for the old man cackled over it, and his cronies joined in with gusto. But, I said, Surely you are not quite correct, for you start on the assumption that all these poor people, or their spirits, will have to take their tombstones with them on the Day of Judgment. Do you think that will be really necessary? Well, what else be they tombstones for? Answer me that, miss. Not to please their relatives, I suppose. To please their relatives, you suppose. This he said with intense scorn. How will it pleasure their relatives to know that lies is wrote over them, and that everybody in the place knows that they be lies? He pointed to a stone at our feet which had been laid down as a slab, on which the seat was rested, close to the edge of the cliff. Read the lies on that, on that thrustine, he said. The letters were upside down to me from where I sat, but Lucy was more opposite to them, so she leant over and read, Sacred to the memory of George Cannon, who died in the hope of glorious resurrection on July 29, 1873, falling from the rocks at Kettleness. This tomb was erected by his sorrowing mother to her dearly beloved son. He was the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. Really, Mr. Swales, I don't see anything very funny in that. She spoke her comment very gravely and somewhat severely. You don't see out funny, ha, ha! But that's because you don't gom the sorrowing mother was a hellcat that hated him because he was a croot, a regular lemiter he was, and he hated her so that he committed suicide in order that she mightn't get an insurance she put on his life. He blew nigh the top of his head off with an old musket that they had for scaring the crows with. Twarn't first crows then, for it brought the clegs and the doubts to him. That's the way he fell off the rocks. And as to hopes of a glorious resurrection, I've often heard him say myself that he hoped he'd go to hell, for his mother was so pious that she'd be sure to go to heaven, and he didn't want to addle where she was. <laughs> now isn't that stain at any rate? He, hamper he hammered it with his stick as he spoke. A pack of lies! And won't it make Gabriel keckle when Geordie comes panting up the grease with the tombstone balanced in his hump and asked to be took as evidence? I did not know what to say, but Lucy turned the conversation as she said, rising up, Oh, why did you tell us of this? It is my favorite seat, and I cannot leave it, and now I find I must go on sitting over the grave of a suicide? That won't harm you, my pretty, and it may make poor Georgie gladsome to have so trim a lass sitting on his lap. That won't hurt ye. Why, I've sat here off and on for nigh twenty years past, and it hasn't done me no harm. Don't ye fash about them as lies under ye, or that doesn't lie there either. It'll be time for ye to be getting scart when ye see the tombstones all run away with, and the place as bare as a stubble field. Ah, there's the clock, and I must gang. My service to ye, ladies. And off he hobbled. Lucy and I sat a while, and it was all so beautiful before us that we took hands as we sat and she told me all over again about Arthur and their coming marriage. That made me just a little heartsick, for I haven't heard from Jonathan for a whole month. The same day. I came up here alone, for I am very sad. There was no letter for me. I hope there cannot be anything the matter with Jonathan. The clock has just struck nine. I see the lights scattered all over the town, sometimes in rows where the streets are, and sometimes singly. They run right up the esk and die away in the curve of the valley. To my left, the view is cut off by a black line of roof of the old house next to the abbey. The sheep and lambs are bleeding in the fields away behind me, and there was a clatter of donkey's hooves up the paved road below. 
The band on the pier is playing a harsh waltz in good time, and further along the quay there is a Salvation Army meeting in a back, in a back street. Neither of the bands hear the other, but up here I hear and see them both. I wonder where Jonathan is, and if he is thinking of me. I wish he were here. Dr. Seward's Diary, 5 June. The case of Renfield grows more interesting the more I get to understand the man. He has certain qualities very largely developed, selfishness, secrecy, and purpose. I wish I could get at what is the object of the latter. He seems to have some settled scheme of his own, but what it is, I do not know. His redeeming quality is a love of animals, though indeed he has such curious turns in it that I sometimes imagine he is only abnormally cruel. His pets are of odd sorts. Just now, his hobby is catching flies. He has at present such a quantity that I have had myself to expostulate. To my astonishment, he did not break out into a fury, as I expected, but took the matter in simple seriousness. He thought for a moment and then said, May I have three days? I shall clear them away. Of course, I said that would do. I must watch him. 18 June. He has turned his mind now to spiders and has got several very big fellows in a box. He keeps feeding them with his flies, and the number of the latter is becoming sensibly diminished, although he has used half his food in attracting more flies from outside to his room. 1 July. His spiders are now becoming as great a nuisance as his flies, and today I told him that he must get rid of them. He looked very sad at this, so I said that he must clear out some of them at all events. He cheerfully acquiesced to this, and I gave him the same time as before for reduction. He disgusted, he disgusted me much while with him, for when a horrid blowfly, loaded with some carrion food, buzzed into the room, he caught it, held it exultantly for a few moments between his finger and thumb, and before I knew what he was going to do, put it in his mouth and ate it. I scolded him for it, but he argued quietly that it was very good and very wholesome, that it was life strong life and gave life to him this gave me an idea or the rudiment of one i must watch how he gets rid of his spiders he has evidently some deep problems in his mind for he keeps a little notebook in which he is always jotting down something whole pages of it are filled with masses of figures generally single number numbers added up in batches and then the totals again in, then the totals added in batches again as though he were focusing some account as the auditors put it Eight July. There is a method in his madness, and the rudimentary idea in my mind is growing. It will be a whole idea soon, and then, oh, unconscious celebration. You will have to give the wall to your conscious brother. I kept away from my friend for a few days so that I might notice if there were any change. Things remain as they were, except that he has parted with some of his pets and got a new one. He has managed to get a sparrow and has already partially tamed it. His means of taming is simple, for already the spiders have diminished. Those that do remain, however, are well fed, for he still brings in the flies by tempting them with his food. 19 July. We are progressing. My friend has now a whole colony of sparrows, and his flies and spiders are almost obliterated. When I came in, he ran to me and said he wanted to ask me a great favor, a very, very great favor. And as he spoke, he fawned on me like a dog. I asked him what it was, and he said, with a, with a sort of rapture in his voice and bearing, a kitten, a nice, little, sleek, playful kitten that I can play with and teach and feed and feed and feed. I was not unprepared for this request. For I had noticed how his pets went on increasing in size and vivacity. But I did not care that his pretty family of tame sparrows should be wiped out in the same manner as the flies and spiders. So I said I would see about it, and asked him if he would rather not have a cat than a kitten. His eagerness betrayed him as he answered, Oh yes, I would like a cat. I only asked for a kitten lest you should refuse me a cat. No one would refuse me a kitten, would they? I shook my head and said that at present I feared it would not be possible, but that I would see about it. His face fell, and I could see a warning of danger in it, for there was a sudden, fierce, sidelong look which meant killing. 
The man is an undeveloped homicidal maniac. I shall test him with his present craving and see how it will work out. Then I shall know more. 10 p.m. I have visited him again and found him sitting in a corner, brooding. When I came in, he threw himself on his knees before me and implored me to let him have a cat, that his salvation depended upon it. I was firm, however, and told him that he could not have it, whereupon he went without a word and sat down, gnawing his fingers in the corner where I had found him. I shall see him in the morning, early. 20 July Visited Renfield very early, before the attendant went his rounds. Found him up and humming a tune. He was spreading out his sugar, which he had saved, in the window, and was manifestly beginning his fly-catching again, and beginning it cheerfully and with a good grace. I looked around for his birds, and not seeing them, asked him where they were. He replied, without turning around, that they had all flown away. There were a few feathers about the room, and on his pillow a drop of blood. I said nothing, but went and told the keeper to report to me if there were anything odd about him during the day. 11 a.m. The attendant has just been to me to say that Renfield has been very sick and has disgorged a whole lot of feathers. My belief is, doctor, he said, that he has eaten his birds and that he just took and ate them raw. 11 p.m. I gave Renfield a strong opiate tonight enough to make even him sleep, and took away his pocketbook to look at it. The thought that has been buzzing around my brain lately is complete, and the theory proved. My homicidal maniac is of a peculiar kind. I shall have to invent a new classification for him and call him a zoophagus, life-eating maniac. What he desires is to absorb as many lives as he can, and he has laid himself out to achieve it in a cumulative way. He gave many flies to one spider and many spiders to one bird, and then wanted a cat to eat the many birds. What would have been his later steps? It would almost be worthwhile to complete the experiment. It might be done if there were only a sufficient cause. Men sneered at vivisection, and yet look at its results today. Why not advance science in its most difficult and vital aspect, the knowledge of the brain? Had I even the secret of one such mind, did I hold the key to the fancy of even one lunatic, I might advance my own branch of science to a pitch compared with which Burdock Sanderson's physiology or Ferrier's brain knowledge would be as nothing. If only there were a sufficient cause, I must not think too much of this or I may be tempted. A good cause might turn the scale with me, for may not I too be of an exceptional brain congenitally? How well the man reasoned. Lunatics always do within their own scope. I wonder at how many lives he values a man, or if it only one. He has closed the account most accurately and today begun a new record. How many of us begin a new record with each day of our lives? To me, it seems only yesterday that my whole life ended with my new hope, and that truly I began a new record. So it will be until the great recorder sums me up and closes my ledger account with a balance to profit or loss. Oh, Lucy, Lucy, I cannot be angry with you, nor can I be angry with my friend whose happiness is yours, but I must only wait on hopeless and work, work, work. If I only could have as strong a cause as my poor mad friend there, a good, unselfish cause to make me work, that would be indeed happiness. Mina Murray's Journal, 26 July. I am anxious and it soothes me to express myself here. It is like whispering to oneself and listening at the same time. And there is also something about the shorthand symbols that makes it different from writing. I am unhappy about Lucy and about Jonathan. I had not heard from Jonathan for some time and was very concerned, but yesterday dear Mr. Hawkins, who was always so kind, sent me a letter from him. I had written asking him if he had heard and he said the enclosed had just been received. It is only a line dated from Castle Dracula and says that he is just starting for home. That is not like Jonathan. I do not understand it and it makes me uneasy. Then, too, Lucy, although she is so well, has lately taken to the old habit of walking in her sleep. 
Her mother has spoken to me about it, and we have decided that I am to lock the door of our room every night. Mrs. Westenra has got an idea that sleepwalkers always go out on roofs of houses and along the edges of cliffs, and then get suddenly wakened and fall over with a despairing cry that echoes all over the place. Poor dear. She is naturally anxious about Lucy, and she tells me that her husband, Lucy's father, had the same habit, that he would get up in the night and dress himself and go out, if he were not stopped. Lucy is to be married in the autumn, and she is already planning out her dresses and how her house is to be arranged. I sympathize with her, for I do the same. Only Jonathan and I will start in life in a very simple way, and shall have to make both ends meet, and shall have to try to make both ends meet. Mr. Holmwood, he is the Honorable Arthur Holmwood, only son of Lord Godalming, is coming up here very shortly, as soon as he can leave town, for his father is not very well, and I think dear Lucy is counting the moments till he comes. She wants to take him up in the seat on the churchyard cliff and show him the beauty of Whitby. I dare say it is the waiting which disturbs her. She will be all right when he arrives. 27 July. No news from Jonathan. I am getting quite uneasy about him, though why I should, I do not know. But I do wish that he would write, if it were only a single line. Lucy walks more than ever, and each night I am awakened by her moving about the room. Fortunately, the weather is so hot that she cannot get cold, but still the anxiety and the perpetually being awakened is beginning to tell on me, and I am getting nervous and wakeful myself. Thank God, Lucy's health keeps up. Mr. Holmwood has been suddenly called to ring to see his father, who has been taken seriously ill. Lucy frets at the postponement of seeing him, but it does not touch her looks. She is a trifle stouter, and her cheeks, her cheeks are a lovely rose pink. She has lost that anemic look which she had. I pray it will all last. 3 August. Another week gone, and no news from Jonathan. Not even to Mr. Hawkins, from whom I have heard. Oh, I do hope he is not ill. He surely would have written. I look at that last letter of his, but somehow it does not satisfy me. It does not read like him, and yet it is his writing. There is no mistake of that. Lucy has not, wa Lucy has not walked much in her sleep the past week, but there is an odd concentration about her which I do not understand. Even in her sleep, she seems to be watching me. She tries the door and finding it locked, finding it locked, goes about the room searching for the key. 6 August. Another three days and no news. This suspense is getting dreadful. If I only knew where to write to or where to go to, I should feel easier. But no one has heard a word of Jonathan since that last letter. I must only pray to God for patience. Lucy is more excitable than ever, but is otherwise well. Last night was very threatening, and the fishermen say that we are in for a storm. I must try to watch it and learn the weather signs. Today is a gray day, and the sun as I write is hidden in thick clouds, high over kettle nests. Everything is gray, except the green grass, which seems like emerald amongst it. Gray earthy rock, gray clouds, tinged with the sunburst at the far edge, hang over the gray sea, into which the sand points stretch like gray figures. The sea is tumbling in over the shallows and the sandy flats with a roar, muffled in the sea mists drifting inland. The horizon is lost in a gray mist. All is vastness. The clouds are piled up like giant rocks, and there is a brule over the sea that sounds like some presage of doom. Dark figures are on the beach here and there, sometimes half shrouded in the mist, and seem men like trees walking. The fishing boats are racing for home and rise and dip in the ground. Swell, excuse me. The fishing boats are racing for home and rise and dip in the ground swell as they sweep into the harbor, bending to the scuppers. Here comes old Mr. Swales. He is making straight for me, and I can see by the way he lifts his hat that he wants to talk. I have been quite touched by the change in the poor old man. When he sat down beside me, he said in a very gentle way, I want to say something to you, miss. I could see he was not at ease, so I took his poor old wrinkled hand in mine and asked him to speak fully. So he said, leaving his hand in mine, I am afraid, my dearie, that I must have shocked you by all the wicked things I've been saying about the dead and such like for weeks past. But I didn't mean them, and I want you to remember that when I'm gone. 
We old folks that be da- daffled and with one foot abaft the crook call, crook hole, don't altogether like to think of it, and we don't want to feel scart of it, and that's why I've took to making light of it, so that I'd cheer up my own heart a bit. But Lord love ye, miss, I ain't afraid of dying, not a bit, only I don't want to die if I can help it. My time must be nigh at hand now, for I be old, and a hundred years is too much for any man to expect, and I'm so nigh it that the old man is already wet in his scythe. You see, I can't get out of the habit of calling, of caffin' about it all at once. The chaps will wag as they used to, as they be used to. Some day soon the angel of death will sound his trumpet for me. But don't ye duel and greet me, dreary, me dreary? For he saw that I was crying. If he should come this very night, I'd not refuse to answer his call. For life be, after all, only a waitin' for something else than what we're doin'. And death be all that we can rightly depend on. But I'm content, for it's comin' to me, my dearie, and comin' quick. It may be comin' while we be lookin' and wonderin'. Maybe it's in that wind over out over the sea that's bringing with it loss and wreck and sore distress and sad hearts. Look, look, he cried suddenly. There's something in that wind and in the host beyond that sounds and looks and tastes and smells like death. It's in the air. I feel it coming. Lord, make me answer cheerful when my call comes. He held up his arms devoutly and raised his hat. His mouth moved as though he were praying. After a few minutes silence, he got up, shook hands with me, and blessed me and said goodbye and hobbled off. It all touched me and upset me very much. I was glad when the Coast Guard came along with his spyglass under his arm. He stopped to talk with me as he always does, but all the time kept looking at a strange ship. I can't make her out, he said. She's a Russian by the look of her, but she's knocking about in the queerest way. She doesn't know her mind a bit. She seems to see the storm coming, but can't decide whether to run up north in the open or to put in here. Look there again. She is steered mighty strangely, for she doesn't mind the hand on the wheel. Changes about with every puff of wind. We'll hear more of her before this time tomorrow. And that concludes chapter six of our read-along together of Dracula. I am... I will catch up on reading the annotated editions. That way, tomorrow we can catch up a little bit on what happened today and maybe discuss a little bit of the deeper meaning of the last couple of chapters um, as revealed through the annotations. So thank you very much for joining me today. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And that is fabulous. Thank you. Oops. Bye. Hello. Okay, I think it's going live already. So, hi, I'm Christina, the manager of the Pacific Beach Library. Thank you for joining me for day seven of our read along together of Dracula by Bram Stoker. Um, of course, it's going to be a fabulous day. Um, I did actually peek into the annotated edition and reread over yesterday's chapter to see the notes, and it was thoroughly amusing. Um, we'll get to it in a bit, but where they were. It was just great because in the sections where the older gentleman, Mr. Swales, I believe it was, was speaking, they would just have a little summary like, this is what he means. <laughs> it was great. Um, I'm going to start out by having some tea. Today's tea is this gorgeous, deep, dark red color. Very appropriate for our vampiric story. Um, but this one is not the blood orange. This is the berry blossom. But isn't that just gorgeous? I really love the color. Oof. Has like a garnet ruby kind of thing. Maybe a little more garnet because it has like a like a, just a dark purple tinge to it. Mmm, really lovely. I was trying to place what's in it because this tea doesn't actually list the ingredients. And I was thinking, I think currants. Probably a little bit of blueberry in there for color, but I'm not certain. But maybe. Blackberries, perhaps? I don't know. It's a, it's a really good tea. I wish I knew it was in it. Um, that would be something, if anyone knows the folks from Cafe Virtuoso, please ask them to list what's the ingredients in their tea, because that is a wonderful tea. I wish I knew it was in it. All right, so let's start by talking a little bit about yesterday's chapter. 
Yesterday we read chapter six of Dracula and basically in chapter six, Mina Murray, the fiance of Jonathan Harker, traveled to Whitby and she went to stay with her friend Lucy Wenestra, I think is her last name. And so she's with Lucy in Whitby and um, they're exploring, it's a city along the coast and um, they're exploring like the old graveyard and they, they meet an older gentleman who's close to a hundred years old. And I believe it was his, let me find it again. I think his name was Mr. Swales. Yes, Mr. Swales. And he's just hilarious, but he, cause he later on explains near the end of the chapter that he's getting older. And so he's trying to make light of death, which he feels to be around the corner and approaching him closer and closer due to, due to his age. But he's, he talks with the young ladies about how, look around this graveyard, like you see all these things written into stone on the, on the headstones, the tombstones, and you can't believe any of it. It's like it's lies, most of it. And he says how, you know, especially with it being a sailing town, a port city, that many of the, the, the tombstones are covering empty graves because the bodies were lost at sea. Um, likewise, too, he talks about like a certain young gentleman, his name was George something, George Cannon, who, um, who died after falling from the rocks and his mother leaves a, puts it a tombstone saying it was erected by his sorrowing mother to her dearly beloved son. He was the only son of his mother and she was a widow. And it's actually, you know, a, the, the Mr. Swale says it was, it was not, um, not to be taken that seriously because he knew that the mother and son had fought for years with each other. And to the point that the son had even said, I hope I end up in hell because I think my mom's pretty pious and I don't want to spend the afterlife with her. <laughs> Sorry. Um, eventually he ends up, you know, shooting himself, killing himself. And it's only after that that he tumbles off the cliff. Uh, but the mother leaves that out in the, in the head on the tombstone. And so Mr. Swales is enjoying being a little bit um, disrespectful. Um, that's not quite the right word but making light of the situation. Um, and so while the young ladies are a little bit surprised and not quite aghast, but just like a little bit surprised by what he's done, he's enjoying needling them, but he's just doing it for good fun. And so what we find then too, is that, let's see, I was going back and forth a little bit. Um, there's a passage from Dr. Seward, who is the um, doctor who had proposed to Lucy and was was refused, um, he is still rather sad about um, that relationship not happening, and he ends up devoting himself to his work, and he talks a bit of, a bit more about his patient Renfield, who is a very odd man. Um, he seems to have a passion for consuming life of other creatures, and specifically he uses his food for his meals and his sugar to attract flies. He then uses the flies to feed spiders. He uses the spiders to feed birds, and ultimately he would like to feed the birds to a cat, but because he can't get a cat, he eats the birds. And he keeps a, a log tallying how many lives he's consumed. So within each bird, he may have consumed 50 spiders. Within 50 spiders, each of them may have consumed however many flies. And so he logs how many lives he's ingesting. And so it's an odd, strange thing that he does. But um, Dr. Seward is monitoring it and is rather fascinated by it. Um, Mina Murray, by the way, in her journals, she makes out a couple extra things. One of the things she talks about is how um, her good friend Lucy, with whom she's staying and indeed sharing a room, Lucy has taken re reverted back to her old habit of walking in her sleep. And so um, in order to protect her from going out, Mina has been trying to lock the door and everything so that Lucy can't go out into the night. Also, Lu uh, Mina refers several times to her, con her concern about her fiancé, Jonathan Harker, mm -hmm. whom she hasn't heard as much from as she normally would. She got a little an, uh, a letter from him that didn't say much other than I'm going to be at Castle Dracula a while longer, which we know that was dictated to him by Count Dracula. And um, but she, of course, doesn't realize that. She just knows that something isn't right with Jonathan. And so she's concerned about his safety. Um, the chapter ends, as I'd mentioned, with her going back to the, um, to the hillside overlooking the cliffs, overlooking the water, excuse me, and her speaking to Mr. Swales and him telling her that, you know, I, I didn't mean to, sacrilegious, that might be the word I was looking for, um, that I didn't mean to 
be too blasphemous with your friend and to disturb you or she that, you know, I'm getting older and I'm just trying to make light of the death that I see coming. But when it comes, I will be ready and, and I'll go. Um, and then he also says too, going along with that idea that death is coming soon, he's, he points out to the sea and he says, look, there's something in that wind and in the, and in the beyond that sounds and looks and tastes and smells like death. It's in the air. I feel it coming. And, um, and he points towards the sea and then he leaves. Then before she goes back, she's met by another gentleman from the Coast Guard who says that he sees a boat, a Russian boat, it looks like, that's behaving oddly and that there's something very strange about the ship. And he says, we'll hear more of her before this time tomorrow. So where chapter seven resumes, it starts out with a news clipping from the Daily Telegraph, a newspaper. Um, and then, of course, there'll be other bits as well. All right, so let's go ahead and resume our story. We're going to continue with Chapter 7, which is entitled Cutting from the Daily Graph, 8 August, pasted in, pasted in Mina Murray's journal from a correspondent, Whitby. One of the greatest and suddenest storms on record has just been experienced here, with results both strange and unique. The weather has been somewhat sultry, but not to any degree uncommon in the month of August. Saturday evening was as fine as was ever known, and the great body of holiday makers laid out yesterday for visits to Mulgrave Woods, Robin Hood's Bay, Rig Mill, Runswick, Staithes, and the regular, excuse me, and the various trips in the neighborhood of Whitby. The steamers Emma and Scarborough made trips up and down the coast, and there was an unusual amount of tripping both to and from Whitby. The day was unusually fine till the afternoon, when some of the gossips who frequent the East Cliff churchyard, and from that commanding eminence watched the wide sweep of sea visible to the north and east, called attention to a sudden show of mare's tails, high in the sky to the northwest. The wind was then blowing from the southwest in the mild degree, which in barometrical language is ranked number two, light breeze. The Coast Guard on duty at once made report, and one old fisherman, who for more than half a century has kept watch on weather signs from the East Cliff, foretold in an emphatic manner the coming of a sudden storm. The approach of sunset was so very beautiful so grand in its masses of splendidly, splendidly colored clouds that there was quite an assemblage on the walk along the cliff in the old churchyard to enjoy the beauty. Before the sun dipped below the black mass of Kettleness, standing boldly athwart the western sky, its darkward way was marked by myriad clouds of every sunset color, flame, purple, pink, green, violet, and all the tints of gold, with here and there masses not large, but of seemingly absolute blackness, in all sorts of shapes, as well outlined as colossal silhouettes. The experience was not lost on the painters, and doubtless some of the sketches of the prelude to the great storm will grace the RA and RI walls in May next. More than one captain made up his mind then and there that his cobble, or his mule, as they termed the different classes of boats, would remain in the harbor till the storm had passed. The wind fell away entirely during the evening, and at midnight there was a dead calm, a sultry heat, and that prevailing intensity which, on the approach of thunder, affects persons of a sensitive nature. There were but few lights in sight at sea, for even the coasting steamers, which usually hug the shore so closely, kept well to seaward, and but few fishing boats were in sight. The only sail noticeable was a foreign schooner with all sails set, which was seemingly going westwards. The foolhardiness or ignorance of her officers was a prolific theme for comment whilst she remained in sight, and efforts were made to signal her to reduce sail in face of her danger. Before the night shut down, she was seen with sails idly flapping as she gently rolled on the undulating swell of the sea as idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean. Shortly before 10 o'clock, the stillness of the air grew quite oppressive, and the silence was so marked that the bleeding of a sheep inland or the barking of a dog in the town was distinctly heard. And the band on the pier with its lively French air was like a discord in the great harmony of nature's silence. 
A little after midnight came a strange sound from over the sea, and high overhead the air began to carry a strange, faint, hollow booming. Then, without warning, the tempest broke. With a rapidity which, at the time, seemed incredible, and even afterwards is impossible to realize the whole aspect of nature at once became convulsed. The waves rose in growing fury, each overtopping its fellow, till in a very few minutes the lately glassy sea was like a roaring and devouring monster. White, crest, white crested waves beat madly on the level sands and rushed up the shelving cliffs. Others broke over the piers, and with their spume swept the land, the land thorns of the lighthouses, which rise from the end of either pier of Whitby Harbor. The wind roared like thunder, and blew with such force that it was with difficulty that even strong men kept their feet, or clung with grim clasp to the iron stanchions. It was found necessary to clear the entire piers from the mass of onlookers, or else the fatalities of the night would have increased manifold. To add to the difficulties and dangers of the time, masses of sea fog came drifting inland, white, wet clouds, which swept by in ghostly fashion, so dank and damp and cold that it needed but little effort of imagination to think that the spirits of those lost at sea were touching their living brethren with the clammy hands of death and many a man shuddered as the wreaths of sea mist swept by. At times the mist cleared, and the sea, for some distance, could be seen in the glare of the lightning, which now came thick and fast, followed by such sudden peals of thunder that the whole sky overhead seemed trembling under the shock of the footsteps of the storm. Some of the scenes thus revealed were of immeasurable grandeur and of absorbing interest. The sea, running mountains high, threw skywards with each wave mighty masses of white foam, which the tempest seemed to snatch at and whirl away into space. Here and there a fishing boat, with a rag of sail, running madly for shelter before the blast. Now and again the white wings of a storm-tossed seabird. On the summit of the east cliff, the new searchlight was ready for experiment, but had not yet been tried. The officers in charge of it got it into working order, and in the pauses of the inrushing mist swept with it the surface of the sea. Once or twice its service was most effective, as when a fishing boat with gunwale under water rushed into the harbor, able, by the guidance of the sheltering light, to avoid the danger of dashing against the piers. As each boat achieved the safety of the port, there was a shout of joy from the mass of people on shore, a shout which for a moment seemed to cleave the gale and was then swept away in its rush. Before long, the searchlight discovered some distance away a schooner with all sails set, apparently the same vessel which had been noticed earlier in the evening. The wind had by this time backed to the east, and there was a shudder amongst the watchers on the cliff as they realized the terrible danger in which she now was. Between her and the port lay the great flat reef on which so many good ships have from time to time suffered, and, with the wind blowing from its present quarter, it would be quite impossible that she should fetch the entrance of the harbor. It was now nearly the hour of high tide, but the waves were so great that in their troughs the shallows of the shore were almost visible, and the schooner, with all sails set, was rushing with such speed that in the words of one old salt, she must fetch up somewhere if it was only in hell. Then came another rush of sea fog, greater than any hitherto a mass of dank mist which seemed to close on all things like a gray pall and left available to men only the organ of hearing for the roar of the tempest and the crash of the thunder and the booming of the mighty billows came through the damp oblivion even louder than before. The rays of the searchlight were kept fixed on the harbor mouth across the east pier where the shock was expected and men waited breathless. The wind suddenly shifted to the northeast, and the remnant of the sea fog melted in the blast. And then, Mirabil, Mirabil Dictu, between the piers, leaping from wave to wave as it rushed at headlong speed, swept the strange schooner before the blast, with all sails set, and gained the safety of the harbor. 
The searchlight followed her, and a shudder ran through all who saw her, for lashed to the helm was a corpse with drooping head, which swung horribly to and fro at each motion of the ship. No other form could be seen on deck at all. A great awe came on all as they realized that the ship, as if by a miracle, had found the harbor, unsteered save by the hand of a dead man. However, all took place more quickly than it takes to write these words. The schooner paused not, but rushing across the harbor, pitched herself on that accumulation of sand and gravel washed by many tides and many storms into the southeast corner of the pier, jutting over the east cliff known locally as Tate Hill Pier. There was, of course, a considerable concussion as the vessel drove up on the sand heap. Every spar, rope, and stay was strained, and some of the top hammer came crashing down. But strangest of all, the very instant the shore was touched, an immense dog sprang up on deck from below, as if shot up by the concussion, and running forward, jumped from the bow on the sand. Making straight for the steep cliff, where the churchyard hangs over the, land, over the laneway to the east pier, so steeply that some of the flat tombstones the rough steens, or throw stones, as they are called in Whitby vernacular, actually project over where the sustaining cliff has, cliff has fallen away. It disappeared in the darkness, which seemed intensified just beyond the focus of the searchlight. It so happened that there was no one at the moment on Tate Hill Pier, as all those whose houses are in close proximity were either in bed or were out on the heights above. Thus the coast guard on duty on the eastern side of the harbor, who at once ran down to the little pier, was the first to climb aboard. The men working the searchlight, after scouring the entrance of the harbor without seeing anything, then turned the light on the derelict and kept it there. The coast guard ran aft, and when he came beside the vessel, excuse me, and when he came beside the wheel, bent over to examine it, and recoiled at once as though under some sudden emotion. This seemed to pique general curiosity, and quite a number of people began to run. It is a good way round from the West Cliff by the drawbridge to Tate Hill Pier, but your correspondent is a fairly good runner, and came well ahead of the crowd. When I arrived, however, I found already assembled on the pier a crowd whom the Coast Guard and police refused to allow to come on board. By the courtesy of the chief boatman, I was, as your correspondent, permitted to climb on deck and was one of a small group who saw the dead seaman whilst actually lashed to the wheel. It was no wonder that the Coast Guard was surprised or even awed, for not often can such a sight have been seen. The man was simply fastened by his hands, tied one over the other to a spoke of the wheel. Between the inner hand and the wood was a crucifix, the set of beads on which it was fastened being around both wrists and wheel, and all kept fast by the binding cords. The poor fellow may have been seated at one time, but the flapping and buffeting of the sails had worked through the rudder of the wheel and dragged him to and fro, so that the cords with which he was tied had cut the flesh to the bone. Accurate note was made of the state of things, and a doctor, Surgeon J. M. Caffrin of 33 East Elliott Place, who came immediately after me, declared, after making, exa making examination, that the man must have been dead for quite two days. In his pocket was a bottle, carefully corked, empty, save for a little roll of paper, which proved to be the addendum to the log. The Coast Guard said the man must have tied up his own hands, fastening the knots with his teeth, the fact that a coast guard was the first on board may save some may save some complications later on in the admiralty court for coast guards cannot claim the salvage which is the right of the first civilian entering on a derelict already however the legal tongues are wagging and one young law student is loudly asserting that the rights of the owner are already completely sacrificed his property being held in contravention of the statues of mortmain since the tiller as emblemship is not proof of delegated possession, is held in a dead hand. It is needless to say that the dead steersman has been reverently removed from the place where he held his honorable watch and ward till death. 
a steadfastness as noble as that of a young Casabianca, and placed in the mortuary to await inquest. Already the sudden storm is passing, and its fierceness is abating. Crowds are scattering homeward, and the sky is beginning to redden over the Yorkshire wolds. I shall send, in time for your next issue, further details of the derelict ship which found her way so miraculously into harbor in the storm. 9 August The sequel to the strange arrival of the derelict in the night, the derelict in the storm last night, is almost more startling than the thing itself. It turns out that the schooner is a Russian from Varna and is called the Demeter. She is almost entirely in ballast of silver sand with only a small amount of cargo, a number of great wooden boxes filled with mold. This cargo was consigned to a Whitby solicitor, Mr. S. F. Billington of Seven, the Crescent, who this morning went aboard and formally took possession of the goods consigned to him. The Russian consul, too, acting for the charter party, took formal possession of the ship and paid all harbor dues, etc. Nothing is talked about here today except the strange coincidence. The officials of the Board of Trade have been most exacting in seeing that every compliance has been made with existing regulations. As the matter is to be a nine days' wonder, there are, they are evidently determined that there shall be no cause of other complaint. A good deal of interest was abroad concerning the dog which landed when the ship struck, and more than a few of the members of the SPCA, which is very strong in Whitby, have tried to befriend the animal. To the general disappointment, however, it was not to be found. It seems to have disappeared entirely from the town. It may be that it was frightened and made its way onto the moors, where it is still hiding in terror. There are some who look with dread on such a possibility, lest later on should it itself become a danger, for it is evidently a fierce brute. Early this morning a large dog, half-bred mastiff belonging to a coal merchant close to Tate Hill Pier, was found dead in the roadway opposite to its master's yard. It had been fighting, and manifestly had had a savage opponent for its throat was torn away, and its belly was slit open, as if with a savage claw. Later, by the kindness of the Board of Trade Inspector, I have been permitted to look over the logbook of the Demeter, which was in order up to within three days, but contained nothing of special interest, except as to facts of missing men. The greatest interest, however, is with regard to the paper found in the bottle, which was today produced at the inquest and a more strange narrative than the two between them unfold, it has not been my lot to come across. As there is no motive for concealment, I am permitted to use them, and accordingly send you a rescript, simply omitting technical details of seamanship and supercargo. It almost seems as though the captain had been seized with some kind of mania before he had got well into blue water, and that this had developed persistently throughout the voyage. Of course, my statement must be taken cum grano, since I am writing from the dictation of a clerk of the Russian consul, who kindly translated for me, time being short. Log of the Demeter, Varna to Whitby. Written 18 July, things so strange happening that I shall keep accurate note henceforth till we land. On 6 July we finished taking in cargo, silver sand, and boxes of earth. At noon set sail, east wind, fresh. Crew, five hands. Two mates, cook, and myself, captain. On 11 July, at dawn, entered Bosphorus. Boarded by Turkish customs officers. Bakshish, all correct. Underway at 4 p.m. On 12 July, through Dardanelles. More customs officers and flag boat of guarding squadron. Bakshish again. Work of officers thorough, but quick. Want us off soon. At dark, passed into archipelago. On 13 July, passed Cape Matapan. Crew dissatisfied about something. Seemed scared, but would not speak out. On 14 July, was somewhat anxious about crew. Men all steady fellows, who sailed with me before. Mate could not make out what was wrong. They only told him there was something, and crossed themselves. Mate lost temper with one of them that day, and struck him. Expected fierce quarrel, but all was quiet. On 16 July, 
Mate reported in the morning that one of the crew, Petrovsky, was missing. Could not account for it. Took larboard watch eight bells last night. Was relieved by Abramov, but did not go to bunk. Men more, down, men more downcast than ever. All said they expected something of the kind, but would not say more than there was something aboard. Mate getting very impatient with them. Feared some trouble ahead. On 17 July, yesterday, one of the men, Olgaren, came to my cabin and in an awestruck way confided to me that he thought there was a strange man aboard the ship. He said that in his watch he had been sheltering behind the deck house as there was a rainstorm when he saw a tall, thin man who was not like any of the crew come up the companionway and go along the deck forward and disappear. He followed cautiously, but when he got to bows, found no one, and the hatchways were all closed. He was in a panic of superstitious fear, and I am afraid the panic may spread. To allay it, I shall today search entire ship carefully from stem to stern. Later in the day, I got together the whole crew and told them, as they evidently thought there was someone in the ship, we would search from stem to stern. First mate angry, said it was folly, and to yield to such foolish ideas would demoralize the men, said he would engage to keep them out of trouble with a hand spike. I let him take the helm while the rest began thorough search, all keeping abreast with lanterns. We left no corner unsearched. As there were only the big wooden boxes, there were no odd corners where a man could hide. Men much relieved when search over and went back to work cheerfully. First mate scowled but said nothing. 22 July. Rough weather last three days, and all hands very busy with salts. No time to be frightened. Men seem to have forgotten their dread. Mate cheerful again, and all on good terms. Praised men for work in bad weather. Past Gibraltar and out through straits. All well. 24 July. There seems some doom over this ship. Already a hand short, and entering on the Bay of Biscay, with wild weather ahead, and yet last night another man lost, disappeared. Like the first, he came off his watch and was not seen again. Men, all in a panic of fear, sent around Robin, asking to have double watch, as they fear to be alone. Mate angry, fear there will be some trouble, as either he or the men will do some violence. 28 July Four days in hell, knocking about in a sort of maelstrom, and the wind is a tempest. No sleep for anyone, men all worn out, hardly know how to set a watch, since no one fit to go on. Second mate volunteered to steer and watch, and let men snatch a few hours sleep. Wind abating, seas still terrific, but feel them less as ship is steadier. 29 July, another tragedy. Had single watch tonight, as crew too tired to double. When morning watch came on deck, could find no one except steersmen. Raised outcry, and all came on deck. Thorough search, but no one found. Are now without second mate, and crew in a panic. Mate and I agreed to go armed henceforth, and wait for any sign of cause. 30 July. Last night. Rejoiced we are nearing England. Weather fine, all sails set. Retired, worn out, slept soundly, awakened by mate telling me that both men of watch and steersmen, missing. Only self and mate and two hands left to work ship. 1 August. Two days of fog and not a sail sighted. Had hoped when in the English Channel to be able to signal for help or get in somewhere. Not having power to work sails, have to run before wind. Dare not lower, as could not raise them again. We seem to be drifting to some terrible doom. Mate now more demoralized than either of men. His stronger nature seems to have worked inwardly against himself. Men are beyond fear, working stolidly and patiently, with minds made up to worst. They are Russian, he Romanian. 2 August, Midnight Woke up from a few minutes sleep by hearing a cry, seemingly outside my port. Could see nothing in fog. Rushed on deck and ran against mate. Tells me he heard cry and ran, but no sign of man on watch. 
one more gone. Lord, help us. Mate says we must be past Straits of Dover. As in a minute, as in a moment of fog lifting, he saw North Portland, just as he heard the man cry out. If so, we are now off in the North Sea, and only God can guide us in the fog, which seems to move with us, and God seems to have deserted us. 3 August. At midnight, I went to relieve the man at the wheel, and when I got to it, found no one there. The wind was steady, and as we ran before it, there was no yawing. I dared not leave it, so shouted for the mate. After a few seconds, he rushed up on deck in his flannels. He looked wild-eyed and haggard, and I greatly fear his reason has given way. He came close to me and whispered hoarsely, with his mouth to my ear, as though fearing the very air might hear. It is here. I know it now. On the watch last night, I saw it. Like a man, tall and thin and ghastly pale. It was in the bows and looking out. I crept behind it and gave it my knife, but the knife went through it, empty as the air, and as he spoke he took his knife and drove it savagely into space. Then he went on, but it is here, and I'll find it. It is in the hold, perhaps in one of those boxes. I'll unscrew them one by one and see. You work the helm. And with a warning look and his finger on his lip, he went below. There was springing up a choppy wind, and I could not leave the helm. I saw him come out on deck again with a tool chest and a lantern and go down the forward hatchway. He is mad, stark, raving mad, and it's no use my trying to stop him. He can't hurt those big boxes. They are voiced as clay, and to pull them about is as harmless a thing as he can do. So here I stay and mind the helm and write these notes. I can only trust in God and wait till the fog clears. Then, if I can't steer to any harbor with the wind that is, I shall cut down sails and lie by and signal for help. It is nearly all over now. Just as I was beginning to hope that the mate would come out calmer, for I, for I heard him knocking away at something in the helm, and work is good for him, there came up the hatchway a sudden, startled scream, which made my blood run cold, and up on the deck he came as if shot from a gun, a raging madman with his eyes rolling and his face convulsed with fear. Save me! Save me! he cried, and then looked round on the blanket of fog. His horror turned to despair, and in a steady voice he said, You had better come too, Captain, before it is too late. He is here. I know the secret now. The sea will save me from him, and it is all that is left. Before I could say a word or move forward to seize him, he sprang on the bulwark and deliberately threw himself into the sea. I suppose I know the secret too now. It was this madman who had got rid of the men one by one, and now he has followed them himself. God help me, how am I to account for all these horrors when I get to port? When I get to port, when will that ever be? 4 August. Still fog, which the sunrise cannot pierce. I know there is sunrise because I am a sailor. Why else I know not. I dared not go below. I dared not leave the helm. So here all night I stayed, and in the dimness of the night I saw it, him, God forgive me, but the mate was right to jump overboard. It was better to die like a man, to die like a sailor in blue water no man can object. But I am captain, and I must not leave my ship. But I shall baffle this fiend or monster, for I shall tie my hands to the wheel when my strength begins to fail, and along with them I shall tie that which he, it, dare not touch. And then, come good wind or foul, I shall save my soul and my honor as a captain. I am growing weaker and the night is coming on. If he can look me in the face again, I may not have time to act. If we are wrecked, mayhap this bottle may be found and those who find it may understand. If not, well then, all men shall know that I have been true to my trust. God and the Blessed Virgin and the saints help a poor ignorant soul trying to do his duty. Of course, the verdict was an open one. 
There is no evidence to adduce, and whether or not the man himself committed the murders, there is now none to say. The folk hero, excuse me, the folk here hold almost universally that the captain is simply a hero, and he is to be given a public funeral. Already it is arranged that his body is to be taken with a train of boats up the Esk for a piece, and then brought back to Tate Hill Pier, and up the abbey steps, for he is to be buried in the churchyard on the cliff. The owners of more than a hundred boats have already given in their names as wishing to follow him to the grave. No trace has ever been found of the great dog, at which there is much mourning, for, with public opinion in its present state, he would, I believe, be adopted by the town. Tomorrow we'll see the funeral, and so we'll end this one more mystery of the sea. Mina Murray's Journal, 8 August. Lucy was very restless all night, and I too could not sleep. The storm was fearful, and as it boomed loudly among the chimney pots, it made me shudder. When a sharp puff came, it seemed to be like a distant gun. Strangely enough, Lucy did not wake, but she got up twice and dressed herself. Fortunately, each time I awoke in time and managed to undress her without waking her and got her back to bed. It is a very strange thing, this sleepwalking, for as soon as her will is thwarted in any physical way, her intention, if there be any, disappears, and she yields herself almost exactly to the routine of her life. Early in the morning, we both got up and went down to the harbor to see if anything had happened in the night. There were very few people about, and though the sun was bright and the air clear and fresh, the big, grim-looking waves that seemed dark themselves because the foam that topped them was like snow, forced themselves in through the narrow mouth of the harbor, like a bullying man going through a crowd. Somehow, I felt glad that Jonathan was not on the sea last night, but on land. But oh, is he on land or sea? Where is he and how? I am getting fearfully anxious about him. If I only knew what to do and could do anything. 10 August. The funeral of the poor sea captain today was most touching. Every boat in the harbor seemed to be there, and the coffin was carried by captains all the way from Tate Hill Pier up to the churchyard. Lucy came with me, and we went early to our old seat, whilst the cortege of boats went up the river on the via or to the viaduct and came down again. We had a lovely view and saw the procession nearly all the way. The poor fellow was laid to rest near our seat so that we stood on it when the time came and saw everything. Poor Lucy seemed much upset. She was restless and uneasy all the time, and I cannot but think that her dreaming at night is telling on her. She is quite odd in one thing. She will not admit to me that there is any cause for restlessness, or if there be, she does not understand it herself. There is an additional cause in that old, poor old Mr. Swales was found dead this morning on our seat, his neck being broken. He had evidently, as the doctor said, fallen back in the seat in some sort of fright, for there was a look of fear and horror on his face that the men said made them shudder. Poor dear old man. Perhaps he had seen death with his dying eyes. Lucy is so sweet and sensitive that she feels influences more acutely than other people do. Just now, she was quite upset by a little thing which I did not much heed, though I am myself very fond of animals. One of the men who came up here often to look for the boats was followed by his dog. The dog is always with him. They are both quiet persons, and I never saw the man angry, nor heard the dog bark. During the service, the dog would not come to its master, who was on the seat with us, but kept a few yards off, barking and howling. Its master spoke to it gently, and then harshly, and then angrily, but it would neither come nor cease to make a noise. It was in a sort of fury, with its eyes savage, and all its hairs bristling out like a cat's tail when puss is on the warpath. Finally, the man, too, got angry, and jumped down and kicked the dog, and then took it by the scruff of the neck and half dragged and half threw it on the tombstone on which the seat is fixed. The moment it touched the stone, the poor thing became quiet and fell all into a tremble. It did not try to get away, but crouched down quivering and cowering, and was such a pitiable state of terror that I tried, though without effect, to comfort it. Lucy was full of pity too, but she did not attempt to touch the dog, but looked at it in an agonized sort of way. 
I greatly fear that she is of too super sensitive a nature to go through the world without trouble. She will be dreaming of this tonight, I am sure. The whole agglomeration of things, the ship steered into port by a dead man, his attitude tied to the wheel with a crucifix and beads, the touching funeral, the dog, now furious and now in terror, will all afford material for her dreams. I think it will be best for her to go to bed tired out physically, so I shall take her for a long walk by the cliffs to Robin Hood's Bay and back. She ought not to have much inclination for sleepwalking then. And that concludes chapter seven. And to me, that sounds like foreshadowing. I do not think that walk is going to tucker Miss Lucy out. I think that we'll find some more sleepwalking happening tomorrow, so we'll see. Um, thank you for joining me today. I hope that you enjoyed today's chapter, and I look forward to seeing you again tomorrow for more from our read aloud together of Dracula by Bram Stoker. Thank you so much. I'll see you next time. Bye. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I'm Christina, the manager of the Pacific Beach Library. Thank you for joining me for day eight of our read along together of Dracula by Bram Stoker. Um, let's see. I'm still getting used to using the computer instead of my phone. It does this long thing where it circles, 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 and I think it's actually working. Let's hope it's working. Um, but today I'm starting with a green tea. Um, I had, what did I have? Oh, um, I had an errand to run during lunch, so I didn't have time to go home, which I usually do. And so I just stopped at Sprouts and picked up some sushi for lunch. And I was like, well, as long as I'm having sushi, I need to have green tea. And so this would be my second pot of green tea for today. Mm. Yummy. So yeah, once you get in the green tea mood, there you are. Mm. Oh, that's a really fun one. I like that. Oh, big now. Okay, so um, let's talk about what happened in yesterday's reading. Yesterday was a little unusual in that um, Google Pixel with Magic Eraser. Out with the majority of the chapter was Buy actually Google Pixel a news 7a and get Pixel Buds that Nina Murray had pasted into her journal, and it was it talked about what had happened on a ship called the Demeter that had been um, run ashore uh, where she was staying at Whitby, and then when they investigated, they found some rather again mysterious things going on on that ship. So we'll start out by talking about that, and then we'll get a little bit more into some bits about Nina's journal. So, in Chapter 7, the, like I said, the majority was an article from the Daily Graph from August, when they're talking about this really devastating storm that was um, raging the area. Hi, Helen! Um, and then what they end, what ended up happening after that was they... So the reporter's talking about the storm, and then the climax is that they see this ship sort of listing in short into port. And it runs aground into the port there. And um, they look closer. The Coast Guard guy goes out in his little boat, and when he gets out there, he sees something horrifying. And it is the sight of the captain's hands lashed to the steering wheel of the ship, um, lashed onto it, tied in place by a crucifix. And this captain at this point is dead. He's probably been dead for a few days. And the storm has buffeted the ship about enough that his hands tied in place with this crucifix, like the, the chain is cut into his hands down to the bone. Oh, it's a really graphic, gory image. It's wonderful. <laughs> um, okay, so this reporter talks about this, and then he says, in the in the continuation of the article the following day, he says that he managed to um, gain access to the log of the captain. And basically what the captain recounts over several weeks is that... Um, The, the crew of this ship are scared, that they, they feel there's something suspicious going on. They're just part of the ship, they have the boxes of earth, and they can't be there, and they're starting to sleep. Are the boxes of earth sticking out the front, and there's a little bit of soundtrack in them. And then they just, you know, they just give themselves a chance to get back to the ship, and they have the boxes of earth that are sticking out the front, and they're just going to be there.
surrounding Dracula and the vampires because as a Romanian that's his local area um, in Transylvania. Um, there's also some Russians on the ship and they seem to be less, you know, knowledgeable about the vampires. Um, this first mate, he ends up eventually investigating and he tells the, the captain recounts how the first mate goes down and says, I'm going to check each of those cases of, of dirt in the, ca 